Planning Committee. Item one on the agenda. January. January. I'll rerun that. Good afternoon and welcome to the January meeting of West North Ants Strategic Planning Committee. Thank you. Item one, apologies for absence and appointments of substitute members, please. We have apologies from uh, councillors Gonzalez de Savage, Hill, Harris, Hack, and Joyce. And we have subs in the name of Councillor Kevin Parker, Councillor Andrew Kilbride, and Councillor Rosie Humphreys. Thank you very much. Item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of interest and in items declared? Councillor Roberts. I do, Chair. Um, I do have a declaration of interest after discussions with the monitoring officer. I deemed it, of course, in accordance with 4.1, the members of code of conduct. I a matter of meeting relates to financial interest or well-being of a relative. I've therefore decided not to take part in item five, AL3 Tiffield toaster development. I believe, of course, it will maintain the professional conduct of an elected member. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Are you intending to leave the meeting during the debate? I am. Thank you for that. I also wish to declare an interest on item five. This is a personal interest, and this is solely with respect to the roundabout element of this application. I also will leave this meeting and take no part in the debate and hand over at that time to the Vice Chair. Item three to confirm the minutes of the committee held on the 13th of December. There has been two, sorry, there have been two amendments to these minutes. I ask Democratic Services to tell you about that, please. Thank you, Chair. Mr Guthrie is to be recorded as an attendee and the, and the address of the objectors is to read Anne Gray, Jason Tate and James Guthrie address the committee objecting to the application. And the address to the committee of the legal advisor is to read Justin Price Jones, planning solicitor locum, outline the application before the committee and advise members that because the committee had inherited the decision by South North Ants Council to grant planning permission, subject to conditions and a section 106 agreement, etc. As members of the new planning authority, they were entitled to decide to either A accept the previous decision by S South North Ants Council and the recommendation now being put forward in the current report without any further consideration of the application or B, to review the application with the possibility that they ultimately come to a different decision as to whether or not planning permission should be granted. Thank you. So with the inclusion of those amendments to the Members agree to those minutes and adopt them. Show of hands, please. Thank you. Accepted. Right. Item, and I will sign those, Julie. Thank you. Item four, Chair's announcements. I've just got a few things to say before we start. Um, I'd like to make four comments. Please be aware that this meeting is being broadcasted live on YouTube for, your, for everybody in attendance. Secondly, members of the public are not allowed to speak or call out during the meeting, save when they're invited to speak during their allotted three minutes. Can we ensure that all mobile phones are either on mute or are turned off? And also those that are using laptops, can we please mute the laptops so we don't have jings when they get messages come in? And finally, it's the intention after item five that we take a natural break uh, before we get on to item six. So at this point, I hand the chair over to the vice chair and uh, I will leave the meeting with Councillor Roberts.
Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is David James, Vice Chairman, taking over temporarily uh, for this item uh, as the Chairman declared an interest and has left uh, the room. Uh, item five is S2020-1644 EIA. It's a hybrid application for employment uses on AL3 at Tiffield Road Toaster. Um, I think I know that members of the, some members of the planning committee were not at the previous committee meeting, and it might be an, an, an idea for me to mention just one or two things, which obviously officers can clarify if it's not accurate. This is a hybrid application, first of all. It's a full application for a roundabout and associated infrastructure and uh, uh, entry uh, to the site and one or two other peripherals. Uh, and then, of course, there are the parameters of the buildings themselves, which are only indicative at this stage. The first part then, the roundabout, et cetera, is a full application. The buildings themselves is an outline application. They would have to be firmed up uh, at a later date if this application uh, were to be passed. Uh, the second thing uh, to note is the, the history of this, how we got to where we are now. Um, put very simply, and again, I'm subject to correction, the uh, local plan uh, for South North Ants uh, allocated uh, three or four uh, sites for employment use, uh, AL1, AL2, AL3, four, and uh, this one is known as AL3. It has been allocated in the local plan. The local plan was passed. The local plan was judged by the inspectorate to be sound. Subsequent to that, uh, an application went before the South Northamptonshire Planning Committee, who were minded to accept it subject to uh, the uh, subject to the ratification of certain items uh, of relating to technical issues. Uh, which officers then proceeded to begin work on. That was on the 7th of January of 21. On the 13th of December uh, 21, uh, the WNC planning committee met here in this room to consider the application and whether to accept the ratification of those items to enable the application to be fully approved as it was then. However, uh, some members of that committee, and, and if my mind is right on this, uh, most members that took part in that proceedings were not on the South Northamptonshire Planning Committee, were not present uh, then. So they were considering it afresh. This afternoon, of course, it's an SNC Planning Committee, but there are a couple or so substitute members. So it's worth bearing that in mind. What happened at that meeting was that members felt that they had been denied a site meeting uh, to examine uh, the visual aspects of the site in particular, and it's more direct uh, uh, observation of location and so on and so forth. Uh, that site meeting took place on Tuesday of this week. In fact, I was present there the, the chairman wasn't present there, obviously, because he, he's not concerned uh, with this particular item. And uh, members were free to walk around the site uh, and were also presented with some visuals too. And I gather that there will be experts here from WNC this afternoon who will be able to provide uh, further information on that for you. And people will be entitled to ask them questions on technical matters. And some of them are very technical. Uh, these people are experts in their own field and they will have the answers uh, to the queries. So without further ado then, uh, I'll proceed uh, with the uh, application and invite the officer, yeah, invite the uh, case officer to uh, outline the application. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, as members may be aware, this item was 
we have been returned to committee following a deferral at December meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee. Since that time, a member's site visit has taken place to ensure members have a better understanding of the development that is proposed. However, I'm aware that a number of members weren't present at the last Strategic Planning Committee, so I'll start by running through what the application proposes. The site is a 34 hectare area of land shown in blue on the plans and is allocated under policy AL3 of the local plan for business, general industrial, and warehouse and distribution uses, as well as ancillary uses. The plan shows the main constraints of the site. So I run, just run through those with you. This dotted line here is the confines for the toaster itself. The green area is the Eastern Nist and Historic Park and Garden. The blue hatched area here is a special landscape area. The pink area is the Eastern Nest and Conservation Area. The hatched area here is a historic landfill. There are a number of bridleways and footpaths in the area. So this here is a, a bridleway that crosses the site, then goes through the shires and then through Eastern Nest and Estate. You have another public footpath here that crosses, goes past the screw fix across the A43 and just to the edge of the site here. And there are a number of footpaths running north to south to the, to the west of the site here. The, um, the green corridor here is a disused railway line, and there are a number of nearby residential properties um, at the, uh, the kennels, which is here. Um, Williams Farm Barns here, and the, the, the Shires Estate, which is located here. The, the hamlet of Caldecott lies to the uh, northwest of the site, and Tifford lies approximately 1.3 kilometres to the northeast of the site. So, just put the site in context with the other AL ap um, applications. So the application we look at today is AL3, and that's this site here, with the main access onto the A43 via the new roundabout. These two sites here combined form the allocation of AL1, and they're split into two sites, which is commonly known as the DHL site and the Bell Plantation site. And there's two separate accesses shown with arrows here and here. This site here is AL2, it's known as the Wool Grower site, with access onto Greens Norton Road. So this plan is the, the parameters plan. Um, the application is a hybrid application in that they request full planning permission for parts of the development and outline permission for the remainder. The part of the application requests full planning permission is essential infrastructure and includes the construction of the new roundabout, which is shown here on the plan, the construction of a new spine road through the development, and the construction of a new footpath and, and cycleway down the Northampton Road, the realignment of the Tiffield Road, the amendment to the A43 junction, so it is left in and left out only and that central reservation gets closed, the construction of the terrace levels for the, for the buildings to, to sit upon, the construction of a surface water attenuation pond in the southwest corner, and the, the structural landscaping which um, surrounds the periphery of the, of the application site. The outline application reserves all matters for future consideration and applies for up to 102,400 square meters of commercial development consisting of a mix of 100,000 square meters of light industrial, general industrial and warehouse and distribution uses. 2,400 square meters of standalone office use. 1,000 square meters of restaurant and retail uses. 1,000 square meters of showroom petrol filling station uses. And in line with policy AL3, 30% of the developable area will be for light industrial and general industrial uses only. So the parameters plan, which is coming on screen, would form part of any planning permission that would be granted, and subsequent reserve matters applications would need to be in accordance with this plan. I can just take you through all the different zones that are part of the application.
first of all, we have zone A here. This is for the smaller retail and restaurant car showroom use, petrol filling station uses, also allowed would be industrial uses, office uses, and max height of the buildings here would be 12 meters to the bridge. Second is, is zone B. This will be developed with two to five units with industrial uses and warehouse with a maximum height of 15 meters to the ridge. Zone C, which is this area here, will be developed with two to five units with industrial and warehouse uses with a maximum height of 21 meters to the ridge. Zone D, which is on the opposite side of Tiffield Road here, which is proposed for a second phase of development will be developed with one to 12 units with industrial warehouse uses with a maximum height of 15 meters to the ridge. It is also intended in this area is for developed for smaller units and this will be secured through the section 106 agreement provided there's a sufficient demand for them. It's proposed that the, the footpath which we saw on the, on the constraints plan crossing the, the southwest corner of the site we stopped up with a new route in town centre created by the Spine Road through the side via the roundabout and via Northampton Road. But however, this needs to be subject to a, so a separate section 257 of the, the, the uh, 257 application and doesn't form part of the application we are considering today. So this is one of two um, indicative master plans submitted by the applicants, which shows how the development might come forward. And just to run through each of the, uh, the phases again, so the zones again with you. So in this plan, we've got zone A showing us a petrol filling station and restaurant use. Zone B with um, two medium sized units ranging from 4,500 square meters to 12,000 square meters. And zone C is this, um, three large units ranging from 12,000 square meters to 28,500 square meters. And zone C, zone D, sorry, with 12 small units ranging from 370 square meters to 560 square meters. The, the second indicative master plan is, is the same as the, the first one, except the, the two units in part in zone C are replaced by a single larger unit up to 44,000 square meters. So this plan shows the, the highway works which are associated with the development and it shows the, uh, the new roundabout on the A43 with a three lane entry into that roundabout and a signalized crossing on the roundabout. A new spine road through and running through the development with a bus turning lane, bus turning area and um, cycle lane. Alterations to the, the Tierfield Road here. Some passing spaces on Tierfield Road. The, uh, the upgrading of the, uh, the footpath along the top section of Northampton Road to create a footpath and cycle way here. And again, the, uh, the, the closing up of the uh, central reservation of the uh, Tiffield Road, so it's left in and left out only.
some for further traffic coming works are proposed along the, uh, the Northampton Road. Um, this is where the, the new roundabout will be. And as you progress down the Northampton Road, there'll be a, a new build out here. Um, outside two Herbert Gardens. Um, so traffic coming in along the Northampton Road have to give way to traffic coming out. And there will be a, a second build out outside 63 Northampton Road. Again, so traffic coming out of Northampton would have to give way to traffic coming in. And the objectives of this is to slow traffic and make the route less attractive to, to non-local traffic. And, and a new signalized puffing crossing is also proposed to just to the south of the, uh, the Long Stay car park on Northampton Road. So this is um, a, a cross section of the, the site, looking at the, um, the indicative master plans and how they would work in terms of levels. So this is the um, what we call the, the multi-building master plan, and shows the, um, the the three units in, in um, zone C, and how they would work with the existing land levels, and that is um, cross section AA, and there's another cross section BB which goes through to the north of the site. So you see the, the red line shows the existing land levels. The first unit would be almost built on the existing land levels, and then with the other units using cut and fill to create the, the level terraces. The maximum height as set in the um, parameters plan of 125.50 AOD. And just for, just for your bearings, this here, this point here is the, uh, the Tiffield Road. So the cross section goes through the attenuation feature and uh, shows the necessary build up the edge of the Tiffield Road to create the, uh, the level plateau for the building to sit upon. So this is a section, second sec cross section and uh, shows the, the, the the build across the master plan with a single larger building shown here on the plan and shows how that works with the existing land levels. So as you can see, for that, to enable that building to be developed, there's a larger cut and fill associated with it. So this area here is, is built up to a larger degree and this area here is, is cut down to a larger degree. But however, the, the ridge line remains the same at 125.50 AOD. So this is the, the landscape plan associated with the, uh, the development. And the, there's a significant amount of landscaping shown in the southwest corner here with a large, large amount of planting. Um, as we saw from the cross sections, uh, the, this is where the attenuation pond sits. Um, it's also probably one of the most prominent parts of the site. And that's where a lot of the landscaping has been, has been concentrated. There's also quite a lot of um, infilling of the Tiffield, hedge, Tiffield Road hedge to, to bolster that. There's quite a lot of landscaping associated with the area just to the south of Williams Barn. And again, on the northern boundary, um, more landscaping um, to soften the impact of the, the, the view of the development from the north. This is an, an existing spinny. Um, so that take, does an already uh, efficient job of, of softening the, the development in the landscape. And again, some enhanced landscaping on the, uh, the eastern boundary of the site. There's already quite a significant amount of landscaping associated with the, the dual carriageway along the A43. However, more landscaping is proposed behind that uh, to, to bolster that, that landscaping to help soften the development in, in, the, in the views from that from the road.
So looking at the landscaping in more detail, I've got a number of cross sections to show you, um, starting with cross section AA, which, which goes across um, Seafield Road, and then we'll work our way down the, through the cross sections, which cuts through the attenuation feature, and then we'll start looking at the cross sections as they work away along the, uh, the A43 up to the eastern boundary again through, through the northern boundary. So this is for your bearings. This is existing Tiffield Road, the existing hedgerow and trees, which will be uh, subject to some, some um, landscape enhancements. This is one of the pinch points of the site. So you, you, it requires this green cribbed wall, which is which is planted up to create the different land levels. Now you notice there are different land levels depending on which of the two um, schemes come forward, either the multi-unit scheme or the single-unit scheme, and that that changes the land levels that are proposed. But that will come forward as part of the, the reserve matters. And there's also a need for the, an, a sound attenuation fence, which also has some planting against it to, to soften its impact. So as you move further down Tiffield Road, you see that you create a lot more space um, to, to landscape the, the development. You've got enhanced landscaping around the Tiffield Road hedgerow. You've got the attenuation feature. Then the bunding that, that leads up to the, the plateaus for the, the development again you'll see there are different plateaus depending on which version of the, the development comes forward again tiffield road cross section through the attenuation features and more planted bunding up to the base of the buildings with heavy set trees Again, different levels depending on what type of development actually forward, comes forward on the uh, on the site. But these 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 levels are set in the parameters plan. Again, another cross section from the Tiffield Road. And different development plateaus. So now we turn to the A43. This is here is the A where the car sits is the A43. We've got a significant amount of landscaping here, which already exists. And then you've got the existing, got additional proposed landscaping sitting in behind that before we get into the development site. Again, different levels depending on which side the development comes forward. So we have here again different cross sections of the site through the A43 as we progress north along the A43 shown in, and it shows how the as you progress further along the A43 there's more of a, a convergence between the, the levels of the, the site and the levels of the road. Um, this is the eastern boundary of the site whereas some additional landscaping is proposed here. Then you've got the uh, northern boundary of the site you see on, on that for you. So when you get to the northern boundary the site, there's a retaining wall and then the, the, the site itself is, is lowered compared to the existing landscape level. But this is the, the existing soldier spinny, which helps us to soften the development of the landscape. And when that comes to an end further on the northern site, again, additional planting is proposed. Again, levels are lower here for the development. And um, this is the planting adjacent to, to Williams Barn. The fire cross section itself is, um, again, turning back to Tiffield Road, um, additional planting behind the hedgerow, and the development here is, is actually dug into the, uh, to the landscape. So looking at some, some visuals now, which are being produced by the, by the developers. So this is um, the view from the A43, looking up towards the new roundabout. And this is a, a visual which has been produced by the developers to show what the, the multi-unit scheme would look like. This is the one with three units in, in zone C. And uh, this is a, a unit, sorry, a, a visual showing what the single unit scheme would look like. This, this, it has two units in, um, in zone C. And 
And this is a, a visual of the new A43 roundabout showing the new development and the, the, the junction to um, Northampton Road be, be here. And uh, this is um, a visual proposed by the developers showing from the play area in the Shire's estate how much of the development would actually be visible from the trees, above the trees. And there's another visual um, which we looked at when we were on site. This is um, shown from the Tiffield Road just near the, the junction to the, the Williams Barns and uh, shows uh, the, the development, which is the zone B development. And it shows it sort of what it would look like um, from that point of view. And with some of the colors suggested, which perhaps sort of to, to, to shade from a sort of darker color um, to, to a lighter color uh, as, it, as it proceeds up the elevation. And this is a, a view from the north of the site. As I scroll across, you've got to see the, the proposed landscaping with the, the building sitting behind against the, the skyline with the Williams Barnes in the foreground here. So when the application was presented to the Strategic Planning Committee in December, the report concentrated on the cumulative traffic impacts of all the toaster employment sites, AL1, AL2, AL3, and AL4. There was a concentration by members on the delay southbound into the Tove roundabout at the junction of the A5 and A43. The cumulative impact assessment shows that the AOL developments excluding AL3 would lead to an additional nine minute delay leading into the roundabout, which is shown. Red on, in red on the graph. The applicants have produced this graph to show the breakdown of delays southbound during the morning peak flow into Tove roundabouts and how they are generated. The yellow section represents AL3, and that shows this development will result in an additional one minute delay into the roundabout. The red section shows how much that delay will be attributable to the impacts of AL1 and AL2, and this totals nine minutes. However, this shows the impact should there not be any mitigation proposed as part of their development. As these developments have not yet got to the committee stage, members will have the opportunity to con have control over any mitigation methods used. The green section represents a blanket growth which would need to be placed into the model if AL3 was excluded from the model. And this shows that if AL3 were to be excluded, there would be an additional four minute delay on that stretch of the road. As the delay is attributable to the L3 shown in yellow, not severe, it's considered there is no reason to object to the application on this basis. Turning now to the previous recommendations to committee, in the, in the report to committee, there were seven items that were delegated to officers to resolve before any planning permission was granted, and officers, officers wish to update you on these. With regard to the sustainability study, officers have been working with external consultants to ensure the right framework is in place. However, further details and measures that will be required will form part of the reserve matters submissions. In terms of energy efficiency, the development will achieve the BRIAM very good standard as required by policy S11 of the core strategy. There's also a firm commitment to ensure that 10% of all the parking spaces will have an EV charging points in accordance with policy INF4 of the local plan. There will also be photovoltaic panels upon the roof of the buildings to cover the base energy needs of the buildings and supply the EV charging points. And the potential for the, EV, for the use of photovoltaic panels will be maximized and is now considered that, that document is acceptable. With regard to the structural landscaping scheme, this has been shown to members during this presentation and on the site visit. 
The landscaping scheme has improved since the application was first reported to the SN committee by increasing the planting on the hedgerow on the Sithfield Road, amending the species and the planting scheme so they are indigenous but also offer greater carbon capture, increasing the zone of planting on the eastern boundary, increasing the area of woodland planting on the western boundary, modifying the gradients of the buns and heights of the buns on the western boundary to better soften the impact of the development, increasing the tree planting on the southern boundary, increasing the bunding on the southern boundary and therefore increasing the height of the landscaping. It is now considered that the proposed landscaping scheme is acceptable. With reference to the proposed lighting scheme for the development, this will form part of the reserve matters approval. However, the lighting strategy which will set the framework for the reserve matters lighting scheme has been amended and this is to include a change to the colour of the lighting near the boundary of the site so they do not include a harsh white luminance, the introduction of control systems for the reduction of illuminance in areas when they're not in use, such as car parks, lorry yards, pedestrian access, and perimeter footpaths. And all lighting bollards will have louvres to detect to direct lighting downwards. It is now considered the framework for lighting proposals are also acceptable. A revised framework travel plan has been submitted, which has clarified the outstanding matters relating to the bus service, the role of the local highway authority in monitoring and approval of the travel plans. And this revised document has been agreed with the local highway authority and is therefore considered acceptable. In terms of development scenarios, there are a number of different scenarios in terms of mix of uses that on the site could come forward as part of the reserve matters. The scenario that generates most traffic for the entire site were to come forward would be a B2 use across the entire site. And that is a scenario that was tested in the transport assessment. This is necessary to test whether the local highway can accommodate the worst case scenario. However, whilst this scenario does generate the most traffic, the scenario where 70% of the site is developed for B8 use and 30% for B2 use generates the most HGV traffic. And it was considered that this also needed to be modeled. The submission for the applicant's modeling this has been received and this demonstrates that this scenario would result in a considerable reduction in the overall traffic numbers um, to and from the site compared to the all B2 scenario, but with a small increase of 48 heavy good vehicle movements over the course of a 20 hour, 24 hour period, with the increases occurring between 6 p.m. and 7 a.m., which is outside the busy urban network peak times. Both highway authorities and the council's transport consultants were consulted on this submission and no objections have been received relating to it. At the time the application was considered by South Northamptonshire Council, National Highways gave comments on relatively minor changes to the design of the A43 roundabout that were needed and also expressed concern about the proximity of the new roundabout to the A43 lay-by. The applicants have submitted an amended design for the roundabout and have submitted a risk assessment to look at the dangers associated with the proximity of the roundabout and the lay-by. The risk assessment has been prepared in conjunction with National Highways and concludes there's no material risks from the retention of the lay-by. National Highways have been consulted on the risk assessment and now no longer raising any issues relating to this. With regard to resolving the issue of how 30% of the site is to be brought forward with B1 and B2 uses, this is to be controlled to a planning condition, requiring the applicants to identify the parts of the sites that were used for these, these, these uses prior to the submission of any reserve matters application. So now, turning to the recommendation, it is considered that the site visit carried out with members and the additional visual information submitted by the applicants to demonstrate the relative impacts of different developments on the Tove roundabout, along with the cumulative impact assessment, have now addressed the issues for deferring the application at the last meeting of the committee. For the avoidance of doubt, the resolution is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions and legal agreement pursuant to the resolution made by South Northamptonshire Council Planning Committee in January 2021, and as per the subsequent updates. Members should be aware when it comes to discussing the application after the public speakers, we have two consultants with us today to help you with your deliberations. First, we have Steve Clark who is able to answer any questions on highway matters. And we have Rebecca Knight, who can answer questions on, on the visual impact of the development. Both of the consultants have been employed by the council and therefore they are your consultants here to give you expert and impartial advice on the impact of the development. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, has anyone any questions they would like to ask of the case officer before we go further? With a momentary lapse. Chairman, just, just, just John Shepherd. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, Andrew, we're here because uh, regulations require us or encourage us to look at the cumulative effect of traffic in a development of this nature where one application is part of a larger application block, which overall can expect to create a certain effect. Yeah. That, is that, is that, that, that's why we're here as opposed to it, would, it was granted a year ago because there's been a, a slight change in regs. Each, each application it needs to be determined on its own merits. Yeah. But there's but, 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 but a requirement within the regulations that the, the, there's a cumulative impact assessment as part of the, part of the transport assessment. In, so, in, and in, that, is, that has been now being carried in, out. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and the, the cumulative assessment uh, suggests uh, that uh, in the approach to the A5 roundabout from the north, uh, there is the delay that you identify, and that has been described as, as severe. Uh, the amount of that delay attributable to this application mm. is yellow on that screen. Yes. So it, for that reason, it's not a material factor. Uh, and uh, it's not something that you would propose to address through 106, because nothing is actually proposed to be done at the moment in relation to the mitigation measures. Is that right? Well, there are, there are a number of how are mitigation measures proposed as part of this development. You know, with with the new roundabout, the, the works to the Northampton Road and the build out. So there are the mitigation measures associated with the development. Yeah, yes, but, not, but not, not at that roundabout. Not, not, at the not, not at this roundabout, because the amount. Of just it has to be you have to you can ask the development to developers to put money into mitigation works it has to be justified yeah there has to be a the problem that's there has to be a problem that needs solving and what we're saying is a one minute delay into the into that roundabout is not a problem that needs solving indeed attributable by by this development on, yeah. on the yellow yeah but but the advice appears to be that if there's a complete build out of all the units uh, then there will be uh, a delay that ends up as being severe. What, what we're saying is each development needs to wash its own face. So yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the nub of it really is this: that that uh, I mean, a 106 agreement, as we know, is is a bi-party agreement. It is a contract. It's not. It's mm. not an imposition. Uh, it is. It is possible, is it not? Uh, for uh, that that document uh, to, at the end of the day, provide for a uh, an element of, of significant mitigation of that roundabout, contributed to by the uh, developers who end up developing yellow, red, and and green. I think and one, it's one complicated, the, but that that could that not happen? One of one of the tests was the only. Can you get imposed a section one of six agreement if there are, if you pass the number of tests? Yeah, so, I, I agree. I'm sorry, when you impose it, yes. But you know, it's, it's a bipartite agreement. If the parties agree to no. it, they can agree anything. We, we, no, we're, the section, section one of still one of six agreements still need to pass the tests for being necessary. That's in the civil regulations. So that any section one of six agreement you require the developer to sign has to be necessary. And what we're saying is, that one minute delay doesn't pass that test. Okay, understood. Any further questions? Councillor uh, Rosie Humphreys. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is really a better question for Steve Clark, but I'll, I'll ask you. Um, you're saying that uh, if 70% of the use was B8, that would reduce the um, traffic. Um, has the um, assessment uh, taken into account that we don't know who's going to occupy this site and, and some B8 use such as Amazon uses lots of delivery drivers in addition to the uh, lower HGVs that will come into the site. So it's, it's quite an unknown, I think. Yeah, um, I think that's probably best Steve. Best question asked okay. to, to Steve, but what, 
what transport assessments require, what the local highway authorities require, is that the worst case scenario is tested. And that's what, that's what they look for in traffic assessments. But if, if you want some more meat on the bones of that answer, then Steve will probably be able to, to help you with that. Councillor Charles Morales. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. The graph you've shown, does that, what would the impact be of the Northampton Gateway development on the journey times for the Tove Valley, the Tove roundabout? That's a, that's a question you'd best ask to our expert transport consultant. We'll move on now then to speakers. The first speaker is Louise Croft, who's an objector. Is Louise Croft here? Thank you. You have three minutes. councillors, not our parish councillors, and certainly not the people of Toaster and surrounding areas. They will blame you for despoiling their historic town and their lives. Trust is easily lost and you should listen carefully to them. You have today the opportunity to review this application from the bottom up. It is your legal right Indeed, this was confirmed to you by the WNC legal officer last month. Please consider if the final local jobs offering will be 1,500 or 500. Will the new Hulkert roundabout paradoxically make the Northampton Road less safe and the Toaster Centre more congested and polluted? Are 90 foot monolithic warehouses really the most appropriate gateway to historic rural town. But the greatest failing is traffic. IM needs to submit a realistic opening year. 2021 was always going to be unachievable for it to be fully operational, which National Highways has recognized. Up-to-date information can then be submitted to run a new NSTM, which applies the same mythology across all the sites AL1 to 4. That is the only way you will be able to accurately and robustly assess the cumulative impacts from across all the developments on the whole local road network. You have paragraph 111 remaining. of the NPPF to guide you, as there is no doubt that, there, that the cumulative traffic will be more than just severe, we will literally be at a standstill. There are so many reasons to justify deferring this application and there is compelling evidence to reject it. This will be your legacy. Please do the right thing, not just for your personal integrity or for the professionalism of this committee, but for the people of Toaster and the future of this historic town. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions members would like to ask of Louise Croft? No? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Our next uh, speaker is Anne Gray, who is an objector. Anne, would you like to come forward?
Fine, you have three minutes. Okay. Chairman, committee members, officers, an amended framework travel plan was submitted only on the 13th of January, 2022, 15 months after the initial application. The original travel plan contained minimal substance and this version also disappoints. The 2018 Northamptonshire bus strategy expects that all employment developments are provided with a high quality bus service from first occupation. This report highlighted three bus routes, but only the X88 remains. It is proposed that this will detour onto the site, but that there are no routes from the massive toaster urban expansion, none from the south, none from the west, none from the north only employees potentially sucked in from Northampton to the east. Of course, sustainable development can also partly be delivered through cycle and walking routes. The plan states that the on-site access road will incorporate a three metre wide segregated shared footpath and cycleway. This proposal fails to achieve the Sustrans five metre desirable minimum for segregated routes. It then states that a new two metre wide shared footway cycleway will be provided along the southern side of Northampton Road, facilitated only, it should be noted, by narrowing the carriageway. The two metre walk cycle route markedly fails to achieve the recognised 3.5 metre desired minimum for shared use pathway plus buffer. It contravenes Department of Transport guidance and will create an increased risk of modal conflict. This is particularly important in terms of creating provision for disabled users. This framework travel plan does nothing more than confirm that the developer is not serious about sustainability and is willing to compromise road safety on a now narrowed Northampton Road that this development will load with HGVs. Remaining. This application is partly predicated on road safety, but it completely ignores safety compromises to users of Northampton Road, Donkey Lane, where traffic is predicted to double, Caldercott Lane, as well as the A43 itself. National Highway statistics show that roundabouts on the A43 attract accidents and Tove is the worst. This is an apology of a sustainability plan. And as a committee, you have not been provided with a clear assessment of it until today. It demonstrates that the proposed development is neither capable of being sustainable nor a natural extension of toaster. I believe that this is reason to be concerned about whether you are being given a balanced view of this application. And this plan alone is reason enough to reject this application. I implore you to act on the legal advice given in December and see it as your duty to take a really good look at this application bottom up, or based on its failed sustainability credentials, kill it off now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are there any questions anyone would like to, uh, members would like to ask uh, Anne Gray? No? Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, Parish Council. Mr. Um, we'll move on then to uh, Parish Council, Mr. Graham Ferry of Tiffield Parish Council. You know that Tiffield is in direct line of fire from this massive development. With the prevailing winds, which we have today, we will suffer constant air pollution and constant noise, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. That complaint, which we have made, has not been addressed. Experts we were promised at the site visit didn't turn up. We also have concerns over traffic. We have no confidence in the traffic plan given by the applicant and supported by the planning officer. So we have derived our own Using data supplied by the various applicants, AL1 to 4, we can predict 12 additional vehicles per minute using the Tove roundabout at peak periods. That will create a further three kilometers of traffic jam. 
Severe would be the word to describe it. The fancy algorithms used by the prejudiced and conflicted traffic consultants just wave the problem away. And the planning officer seems daft enough to fall for it. If this development or indeed any of the others proposed for Toaster goes ahead, we will endure severe traffic gridlock morning and evening at peak periods. No sensible mitigation has been proposed because none exists. This gives sound grounds to reject the application and that's what we want you to do. I also have a strong message to carry to you from the people of Tiffield. Many residents have taken time to present well thought out objections to this development. They have all been dismissed. Why? Because the planners believe that the economic benefits outweigh the harms to the area. It's in the planning officer's report, time after time, and it is rubbish. There is no economic benefits to the benefit to the residents of this area, just long-term damage. My job, remaining. my job today is to reflect the anger and frustration of the people I represent. And to do that, I now propose a vote of no confidence. A vote of no confidence in the current officers of the council's planning, economic and legal departments. We are not satisfied with your performance. It must change and it must change now. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions members have for Mr Ferry? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Right. Well, we have no MP present who's asked to speak. Uh, we'll move on to the local ward councillor, uh, Councillor Maggie Clubley. Thank you. Today is an extremely emotive for all day for all our residents as the future of our beautiful historic town and rural community is firmly in your hands. This application in its current form cannot be allowed to proceed due to the traffic situation in the whole of Toaster, air pollution and effects on the environment. This application is not one intended to be received under the local plan. It is well known that councillors within the then SNC did not envisage this type of large scale application coming forward and would not have signed the plan off if they had known it would be open to this type of application. Such is the concern of WNC in relation to the future development that independent planning consultants have been instructed to prepare a supplementary planning guidance to act on as addendum to the local plan, which will clearly state for the avoidance of doubt, the size of permitted buildings, e.g. small to medium, reiterate that unemployment is low in Toaster, the dynamics are not those where people are looking for minimum wage jobs, those jobs do not support the housing stock in Toaster. The relief road currently being constructed cannot be factored into any mitigation. This road is being built for the benefit of residents with section 106 monies from Persimmon. They have not funded this road for use by IM or other large businesses, which will run through the middle of a housing estate when finalized. The traffic reports concentrate on the A43 and A5 without considering residents and the current situation. Toaster is facing applications from a further five sites, all of which will be reliant on the A5, A43. National Highways and WNC must look at traffic in more detail than they have to date for the protection of residents. seconds remaining. And so as not to jeopardise the developments on any other allocated sites. The application in its form cannot be allowed to proceed. 
the committee can and must review the application in its entirety to decide its suitability for toaster. You are not bound by the previous SNC decision. Agree perimeters for traffic reports for all allocated sites and ensure they are cumulative. Consider the environment aspects, especially air pollution, especially as toaster residents living on the Watling Street have been notified by West Northampton Council in December to keep their windows closed to avoid air pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions that members would like to ask the council public? No? Thank you, Maggie. Right, we then move on to our supporters. There are none registered other than the applicant agent, Damien Holstock of Turley. And we've decided to permit exactly the same as we did at the last meeting of the planning committee uh, to bring his two advisors to the table as well. Uh, his two advisors are David Smith, who will do the speaking, and David Neal, who's uh, an expert too. And I believe that uh, David Neal and David, so David Smith will answer questions as appropriate. Thank you. If you'd like to come forward, the three of you. Chair, <clears throat> members, thank you for the further opportunity to address you this afternoon. You may recall that I addressed planning committee in December last year, and indeed January 2021 before that. Whilst naturally disappointed with the committee deferral in December, we understood that it was important for members to receive the further reassurances sought in order to conclude their determination of the application and to undertake the site visit as requested. We hope the latter was useful in helping members appreciate how the proposals can be appropriately accommodated on the site with limited and localised impacts. It's worth noting we spent at least six months during the course of last year working with the Council's landscape advisors to reach an acceptable solution, which balances constraints and opportunity to realise the AL3 allocation. The position in respect of highways remains unchanged. The cumulative impact work submitted in September 21 has been accepted by the highways authorities and the council's own highways advisor with opportunity afforded to other AL site promoters to engage. These are the independent experts who are satisfied there is no reason to withhold planning permission on highway grounds. Our team has responded to extensive questioning around the approach, assumptions and outcomes. Nothing has emerged since December last year which changes the position, though some parties might have you believe otherwise. It is clear the impacts of AL3 are acceptable, and from the information you have seen today, not only does the scheme deliver crucial highway improvements as per the policy requirement, but the real impacts of concern are generated by those schemes comprising AL1, both of which will be subject to scrutiny by this committee in due course. Furthermore, it is apparent that the improvement works associated with AL3 will actually assist in the mitigation of additional delay associated with traffic growth forecast up to 23. Before concluding, it's worth adding that we have observed much public conjecture and speculation around the quality of the development and the employment opportunities that it will create. It continues to be a source remaining. of much frustration that the industrial logistics sector is much maligned. We are confident that not only will the development accommodate a range of businesses within a range of building sizes, but those opportunities will be diverse and well paid. It is now four years since we commenced pre-application engagement with NS NNDC, including extensive discussions on the scope and form of technical assessment work. All of this work has been accepted and impacts carefully weighed in the balance. We are 16 months on from the submission of the application and would urge members to accept the officer's recommendation to resolve to approve the application subject to completion of associated legal agreement and thus allow us to turn AL3 allocation into a reality. Thank you. Thank you. 
Members, any questions that you would like to ask the agency's advisors? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rosie Herring. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, obviously there were two options put there. One, the very large building and one where the building was actually um, broken up into smaller um, buildings. How likely is one versus the other? <clears throat> I'll take that one. It's really difficult to predict. I mean, we're trying to accommodate uh, as much flexibility as we can um, to respond to market requirements. We know um, there is interest and demand for units of the larger size of the spectrum, the larger end of the medium uh, unit in our world. But equally, we want to make sure that we provide the ability to deliver a smaller, a range of smaller units across the site. So I couldn't, I couldn't answer um, conclusively which way it will go, but what we're seeking is approval to allow us to deliver the, 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 the greatest diversity that we can across the site. Next question. Right, thank you. Yes. Just give them a chance to go back. Yeah. Yep. I haven't got them down on my list. They're not on my list. Yeah, I think are you making reference to the reserve objector. Is that what it is on the list? I think that was on the basis that those two objectors are allowed, two turned up. So they spoke. So that's what's deemed to be the appropriate approach in relation to a balance of speakers. Uh, Chair, if I can, while I'm uh, yes, through ask. you, um, I appreciate a couple of the speakers uh, mentioned the previous advice given by a legal advisor. Um, in relation to the fact that this committee is not bound by the previous de decision of the previous council. Um, that is correct. Um, it is open for you to decide this. Um, I would also point out that obviously this aspect is in your local plan and you have the relevant officers here that have um, obtained the relevant advice from specialists in, in regard to the elements that are to be considered. And, uh, and as such, I leave it for you to decide the matter, but as a point of record, I do repeat that advice. Thank you. Could I ask that our two experts come forward, WNC experts to take the table here before we open it up for debate so that members can direct questions to them if, as and when necessary. Right, members. Councillor Rosie Herring. It's actually a, um, a one about the local plan and uh, for the planners, really. Just, just um, is there a, a rule of thumb um, of the amount of employment land versus residential land that is the right balance that you would normally seek? Not really, no. Um, so the the South North Ants part two local plan didn't allocate any new housing sites because the existing allocations and the existing planning permissions, the, the, there was sufficient of those to meet the South North Ants housing need. It only allocated employment sites because um, the, it was considered that the case was made for, for those employment sites. So it's it. The, the local plan did go through a number of rounds of consultation. It was supported by um, evidence base and it went through independent examination in public in this room where an, uh, an inspector from the planning inspectorate considered both whether we'd followed the correct legal process and whether we'd reached the correct um, conclusions 
with the evidence that we prepared and he concluded that yes we had in both of those cases Councillor Andrew Kilbride. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'd like to know about the noise implications. Obviously, we've got a number of houses there. And if, say, DHL will go in there, there's going to be lots of lorries uh, going there throughout the night. Uh, what will the impact be on those residents um, uh, and on the highway, really? How will that be offset? So there's the two elements that one is the buildings themselves and then the, the, the traffic noise yeah. as well so yeah. in terms of in terms of the buildings so there's some more work to be done about those depending on where the location of the building the design of the buildings there's some mitigation schemes to come forward in terms of those that will come forward at the reserve matter stage so in terms of making sure that the, the, the noise from the buildings is not excessive in terms of the um, noise from the traffic that's been looked at by an environmental protection officers and then that can look increased noise and it was found that it wasn't a significant problem. So I guess where I'm coming from is the amount of lorries going onto there near the houses. I mean, yeah. is highways concerned about that? Because obviously you have a lot of uh, road, road noise, don't you? Are we talking are we talking on the Northampton Road or the A5 or the A43? Uh, well, which... near, near where the villages uh, are, really. Um, well, we have... We have, our like transport. We have hundred meters away. Yeah, we have we have our transport consultant Steve Clark here, who's, who's familiar with the modelling, and he'll be able to tell you about the the traffic impacts on on the villages. Could you stay, please? Are you talking specifically in relation to additional traffic through the villages of Caldercutton? Yeah. Well, the, the the work that has been done um, demonstrates that there's very little traffic going through the village, and given the fact that the width and the alignment of the roads between the development site and to the villages are so poor. I would be very much doubt that there would be any HGVs going through those villages. And even if there was, um, I would just remind you that um, within the Section 106 agreement, £150,000 has been set aside for any unforeseen issues that may arise. But professionally, I would advise you that I would doubt very much that there would be any heavy goods vehicles travelling down them lanes through those villages. Councillor Rosie Herring. And I just want to come back, actually, to the supporting uh, fellow councillor in that there must have been some work done about uh, the um, noise uh, mitigation because you wouldn't have been asking for acoustic um, screens and buttons if um, some assessment hadn't been done about the noise impact. Somebody's decided that they needed those. They wouldn't have done it just, you know, for the sake of it. There is, there is some, a noise impact assessment, which is um, appropriate for, for an outline planning application. So there's certain parameters, you know, you, you can expect, um, but there's some, some more detailed um, work to be done at reserve matters, which will then sort of fine tune that work of exactly what the, uh, the mitigation works would be. But we've not been privy to to that information. It, it's, it's all in, it's all included in the planning application, yes, and, and in the and in the environmental impact assessment. Councillor Rosie Humphreys. Yes, um, just a further question about the traffic going through the villages. If uh, the B8 use is, say, something Amazon-like, there might be a lot of extra delivery drivers who, who in smaller vehicles who'd use the uh, villages. Have you got information on that, please? Again, I assume you're talking specifically about traffic through the, the villages. Yeah. Um, well, the modelling work that has been done has identified a small level of traffic that will travel through the villages, but the volume of that is small. Um, and it's so small that it's not uh, a concern from a highways point of view. But modelling is not a perfect science. Um, and that's why um, the, the, there's a, a large sum of money being set aside just in case uh, issues arise um, after monitoring the effects of the development. Councillor 
So when you say it's small, what, have you got a, a figure? Well, during the peak, uh, the AMPM peak, um, you're talking about 40 uh, additional trips during, it does vary a little bit, but it, it generally amounts to about 40 two-way trips and that's in and out, uh, two-way along the road. And that's during the peaks during the 2021 assessment and the 2031 assessment. Councillor Stephen Hibbert. And this is for Stephen too. Um, <clears throat> we're told in the report that <clears throat> the highway authorities support the application. Has there been any weakening of that position in recent times? Because there was a technical note that came out in draft on the 5th of January that came, seems to suggest otherwise. Yeah, I, I saw the documents that you are referring to the one on the 5th of January, and then that was followed by the correct one on the 13th of January. The one on the 5th of January was a draft. It wasn't addressed to anyone in particular, but it made uh, a reference to the fact that all allocations should be involved in the cumulative assessment. Um, after the error was um, found, that was rectified, and you'll find that the, the notes on the 13th of January makes it specific that that note was intended for the AL1 and AL2 allocations only. Well, I, I'm not here to speak for the highway authorities, but I've read and read numerous um, correspondence between the local highway authority, national highways to the local planning authority. And I've not seen any change in their stance on the application. Councillor John Shepherd. Stephen, again, um, you identify or accept, I suppose, the evidence uh, that there is a severe impact occasioned by the cumulative effect uh, on uh, the A5 roundabout. Uh, and uh, would you go further and say that were we looking at an ap applications across the whole of the sites available, there are sufficient mitigation measures that you could devise uh, that would reduce that cumulative effect below the severe description? Well, as outlined earlier on, each application has to be considered on its own merits. And in relation to the cumulative assessment that has been done uh, in recent months, it demonstrates that the AL3 allocation um, doesn't adversely affect the southbound approach to Tover Roundabout. In fact, if you look at, if you remember the graph that was um, produced earlier on. It demonstrates that although AL3 adds one minute additional delay, if you contrast that with the 2031 situation where there is no AL3 allocation um, and it's just background <laughs> growth that's taken into account, what that demonstrates is that there would be a four minute delay so in fact, AL3, by going in there, it intercepts traffic and it actually makes things slightly better at Tove Roundabout. So there's a three minute improvement by the AL3 allocation going in. Yes, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that we, we, we appear to have two conflicting requirements. First is to consider the application on its merits. And secondly, to consider the effect of the, of the cumulative effect. Yeah, but I would, I would remind you that the local planning authority are bound by the tests in the national planning policy framework. And those tests are set out quite clearly in relation to planning conditions and planning obligations. In that sense, any mitigation that's sought from a proposed development, it, it has to relate to that development. There has to be a negative impact to justify seeking a, a contribution or an improvement. Right. And the graph demonstrates that the AL3 allocation does not 
exacerbate the situation that's over and about. Okay, okay, I, I, I understood. You're, you're not you're not directly answering my question, but uh, I'll leave that in the air. And also, it rather, does leave in the air the question of uh, what are we doing here? I mean, if in fact, uh, you know, we we are required specifically to look at the application as it is. I mean, that was done in January last year. Uh, you know, we are here to look at the cumulative effect. And yet your view is that we should not uh, use the cumulative effect as a material consideration. I think we have to, to I, I would say again, that we have to be bound by the tests in the national planning policy framework. If there is no negative impact identified, we can hardly justify a contribution on the back of AL3. It would be unfair, it would be unreasonable in the context of that policy. Councillor Rosie Humphreys. Sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure Rosie I'm Harry. understanding what, what you're saying about this contribution and negative impact. Are you actually referring to the roundabout? Is that what you're saying? I, I think we're talking we're talking specifically about the tow roundabout, yes, and the graph that was produced earlier. Because it's slightly chicken and egg, isn't it? Because um, the roundabout's only there to service the site. Or we need the site we're, to, we're, ha to have the roundabout. We're not talking about the access roundabout, no. we're talking about the tow roundabout. Uh, well, that's already been upgraded, hasn't it? Recently. Yeah, but I think what we've been talking about is the impact of the allocations on that roundabout. I think I think the thing we're, we're really talking about is the impact it's going to have on all of our citizens of trying to get from A to B. Funnily enough, and, and I was actually going to ask you um, for some details of how you actually did the work, because I remember asking you you know had you actually been to toaster how how the whether it was a desktop um exercise or so on and funnily enough when we went to the um site visit on tuesday and i come from the south so i come from brackley and i went past the tow roundabout and i went through okay traveling north but there was a queue traveling south on both on both carriageways there was no accident or anything nothing nothing holding it up it's just volume of traffic and that queue at 10 10 o'clock in the morning um stretched beyond the blissworth um turning almost to the almost to the m1 um, as i was traveling through i was thinking when when is this queue going to end and I, and I just wonder you know what timings and what efforts you've you've um, gone to to actually collect the data that would show things you know like that i haven't personally collected any data um my job really is to undertake a desktop exercise of all the transport assessment work that's been undertaken on behalf of the developers and advise the local planning authority whether that is a robust assessment. Me visiting the site on a particular day wouldn't really tell me a great deal. It would just simply be a snapshot in time. Mm. And I think the important thing here is to remember that the traffic flows that have been derived as a basis to do the transport assessment work, that has been based on the strategic model, NSTM. And that was based on a validated model based in 2019. So that's the base. And when I say it's a validated model, what they do is validate it and calibrate it to make sure that in 2019, that, that model is replicating conditions on the site at that particular time. And when they're satisfied that that's the case, they can then test other scenarios. And that validation exercise has been undertaken and it was approved, I believe, by the highway authorities. So that is a sound basis then upon which to test other development scenarios. Um, so that, that's what has been done. Okay. Uh, Councillor Manners. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, David, could you just confirm to me that the gateway, Northampton Gateway at Junction 15, which has been built, I mean, it's subject to a planning um, approval this afternoon, those forecast traffic movements have been taken into account in terms of the cumulative traffic assessment. Yes, and it was found that there was negligible, negligible impact. <laughs> so 700 acres of warehousing is going to have a negligible impact on the tow, on the A40, A43. The, the, the additional traffic through that junction from the AL3 was negligible. And then thus the tow valley. Yes. Tow, tow roundabout. I find that quite difficult to, 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 to understand. I understand it'll, traffic will go north, south, east and west, but the stuff coming west will be more than negligible. That's, I, can't, I can't understand how you can uh, make a statement such as that, I have to say. On page 53 of the report, it says the Wappenham Road into Abthorpe roundabout decreased time of four minutes. Where does that come from? Well, I, I, I didn't do the modelling. I can only report on the outcome from the modelling. And um, I mean, the Wappenham Road to the Abthorp roundabout, AL3 side has absolutely no bearing on that, that junction. That is traffic coming from the Wappenham and other villages. So I can't understand how we can state a decreased journey time of four minutes. Andrew, do you know why? I think I know, Vice Chair. We do have the um, the author of the uh, report in, in the room, and through you, it might be possible to ask him a factual question on that. Yes. Whereabouts, Dave Neil? Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. Yes, but the McDonald's round by. <coughs> Nobody actually says says here Wattam Wattam Road into Abthorpe Roundabout decreased journey time of four minutes. I mean, it doesn't doesn't stand up to scrutiny that. I mean, it's when I find a mistake such as that, it sort of pushes the whole credibility of some of this modelling into question. I mean, if you can say that there's a, going to be a decrease of time, which there clearly isn't going to be a decrease in time in, in practical terms. Um, I'm not saying that the AL3, the people going to work there will increase the time. That's not what I'm saying, but it just doesn't bear. It's just not realistic. And I, and I, I still am puzzling as to, you know, really why DHL, I mean, we've covered it a little bit with Councillor Shepherd, but I mean, I think, you know, I'm not to use the model for incorporates all the developments under the NSTM model seems to me a completely flawed exercise. I take your point, we have to treat these individually, but I do find that difficult to accept. Through, through you, Chairman, I think um, it's, it's important to explain the limits of what we're doing. I think uh, you, you heard from, um, from Mr. Clark right at the beginning that the modelling is because we're, we're trying to, to predict what's going to happen because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. That's the purpose of the model. It's, it's not going to be 100% right in every single... Um, in every single in input and every single output. But what it does do, it provides a, a consistent way of um, estimating what the impacts are going to be of individual developments, but also of um, a series of individual developments taken together. And that's the cumulative assessment. Now, whether every single input and every single output in every single case of those assessments is 100% correct. 
I don't think is um, my, my advice to the committee would be not to make your decision based on that. What I would say is that we have we have a number of people who they have one job and it's to do this modeling. And yes, some of them are working for the applicant, some of them are working for others. We as the planning authority have, have we have a responsibility to weigh up balance of probability, not beyond all reasonable doubt. So there's a different um, there's, there's a different burden of uh, of uh, upon us of the evidence that we would that we would base our, our opinion on. And the position that we that we are in is that we have the applicant who has their, their modeling expert has put forward in their professional opinion what is the best um, the best representation of what the impacts of their development is going to be and the, uh, also provided that within the context of the cumulative impact of other known developments in accordance with the regulations. We have West Northamptonshire Council Highway Authority has checked that and has not found fault with it. We have national highways, which is the, um, the, the for the wider benefit of those watching, is the government's um, a body that is responsible for the strategic highway network has also looked at those assessments and has not found fault. And even though we didn't have to, we as the planning authority, we thought we would go one step further and we, we commissioned Mr. Clark, an independent expert with credentials to have a look at that um, th those conclusions of all of those experts and say, are they reasonable and realistic in his professional experience? And he said that he hasn't found fault either. So my, my strong advice to the committee would be to listen to, to, to all of that expertise, all of that technical expertise that, um, that is all pointing towards the, the modeling being as robust as it can be and the impact not being um, of, of such severity that the plan permission should be denied. Before, uh, before I ask you, Charles, I was just wondering. If, I just uh, want to come back on that point, please. Would you make a response to right. that? To the back. Sorry, I, I know it's not necessarily. I just wondered if it's worth me explaining the NSTM and the previous question because we went through this. What I'm looking at is a statement in a document which is patently doesn't make sense, that should have been checked by yourself, dare I say, dare I say and doesn't bear scrutiny. I mean, I take the point about all the experts, but when experts produce rubbish, I'm, how am I to have confidence on the journey time since the Tove roundabout? I think that, again, I've, uh, it's always dangerous to speak for other people. I think the experts would would um, would challenge that that they produce rubbish. I think um, I refer to my earlier comments that not every single um, element of of a model is going to be one hundred percent accurate. What we're looking at is the general impact. What what's the impact as best as we can get it? But we can't be one hundred percent accurate because we can't see into the future. Is that's that's why it's a model, and so we can't base a decision. On, where, on saying that we've identified one bit of a, of a technical report that we personally don't find credible. That's, that would be um, not a robust way to make a decision, in my opinion. Councillors? I, th I, I think I have to support um, uh, my councillor, fellow councillor, there, in that it, it's it's our local knowledge and experience that live with this um, this traffic problem every day, which is not according with the academic desktop um, exercise and the figures that we're being given. So it, it doesn't fill us with confidence. That's all I would say. Councillor Andrew Kilbride. I totally agree. I, I have to uh, support my fellow councillors on that point. Uh, the information, we have to make a judgment on the information given. And I have no confidence now in that report because of what my fellow councillors just raised. Charles. 
Chairman, are we moving on to debate now? Almost. Um, Chair, if I can, through you, I mean, I'd reiterate your officer's advice here that you seem to be clinging on to one straw in relation to the whole aspect when you have, sorry, Councillor, if you, if you could just listen for a moment, it is the point that you have the highway authority and an independent highway expert agreeing with the highway assessment. And it appears to me that, that, that to be honest, if this was an appeal, if you like, you'd be saying you're picking up on, if you like, one typo to make the whole document irrelevant when you this has been verified by two other um, experts in their field. So I would just raise that when you look to see how much weight you should put to that consideration in terms of the one line in the report. Thank you, Chair. I find that a very biased perspective. When you're looking at data, you want to reflect on the data that's provided and the experts that provide that data. And if the experts don't pick up on what I call an anomaly like that, then it creates concern for me that the overall data is as accurate well, or as forecasted as be accurate as it, as it might be. Councillor Penny Flavor. Yes, I can. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor, if you could press the microphone because it helps to pick it up for the recording. Is that, that fine? Okay. This may make me sound and appear very stupid, and if it does, I'll accept that. Although I have done planning on the borough initially for a number of years. I wanted, if I may, and this may be relevant to what my fellow council is saying, go to what we're here for today, which is to delegate to the assistant director for growth, climate, etc., to grant permission for these things, which means that we're not actually doing that particular point, if I may be wrong here today. But if you then go to the list, and one of them is says, about transport assessment and outstanding issues for the roundabout and all that sort of thing. Could, Jim, perhaps you can, could you explain it to me? Am I completely off the ball here? It is, I think um, part of the confusion about exactly what we're, um, we're looking at here is because it, this is the third time that it's been to the committee. Mm -hmm. So the previous, the, the first, resolution uh, which was the then South Northamptonshire planning committee resolved to grant permission subject to a number of technical issues being resolved Fine. that that um, was then returned to the West Northamptonshire committee in December yeah. uh, which was then deferred for a site visit and for for, for a, a couple of other reasons yeah. so the the reason that we're here today is to, to make the decision, is to, to make a resolution whether to grant planning permission subject to section 106 and conditions or to do something else. And the, the recommendation is to, to grant planning permission subject to the, the legal agreement and the conditions. Because there, there seem to me to be an awful lot of things that this director has got to make decisions upon. Well, uh, um, Mr. Longbottom's presentation clarified that uh, a lot of work has been done to um, on on those issues to to bottom those out. It's not unusual for um, for a, a, a recommendation to be to um, to to delegate to to agree those details. So it's it's not a case of this being half baked in any way, and I certainly. Um, would hope not when we're 16 months in. So even if I may, sorry, this is the final thing. Even if I may, after three visits to committees, what we're doing today is not really making a proper decision because we're passing it on. Is that right? Or is that just me being very stupid? It, it's not you being stupid. Um, the, the, the committee makes a resolution and the 
the, the decision isn't made until the decision notice is issued and the decision notice isn't issued until the section 106 is um, signed and sealed and until all the conditions are agreed. But that's the, that's the detailed wording that you have lawyers to do and you have planning officers to do. But the, the committees, um, the, 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 the important role of the committee is um, to, to make the, the decision, is this something that we should, that we should um, grant permission for or not? Fine, thank you very much, thank you. Chairman, are we moving to the debate? Yes, we are. Thank you. Can I, can I, make, can I kick the ball off? Uh, we've had a couple of hours on this. We had a couple of hours in December. South of Hans probably had a couple of hours in January last year. That's six hours or so. Uh, I come for this completely new from Bowton, north of the town. So do another mem another, no, a, a number of us around this table uh, comes to this completely, completely afresh. I, I wish I could look at it uh, on a clean piece of paper basis. Uh, I think it was Anne Gray who said we should look bottom up. Um, you know, I regret we can't, frankly, and we, we, we just, it, that's impossible. We've got to regard uh, the existence of the local plan, uh, the fact that uh, we, every expert that tells us, uh, that we've hired, that tell, has tells us things that we might not like to hear, but it's, it's factual expert evidence, a proper opinion of professionals, we, we must be fair, of highways, landscape officers, uh, that uh, uh, identifies, frankly, nothing uh, that would stand up on appeal uh, were we to refuse to grant. Uh, the, uh, it is said that we should have, that the decision should be made by local members. Well, local members much more local <coughs> to, to, the, to the situation than us uh, made the decision last January. That was a, a membership comprising entirely South North Hans councillors, and they made the, the decision in principle. Uh, I'm not prepared to say that they were wrong uh, based upon any new evidence or indeed based upon a, a sort of reappraisal of the whole thing. Uh, as I said, I, I live in a, a village not entirely dissimilar uh, from the combination of Tiffield and Toaster north of uh, Northampton. Uh, and uh, I certainly would seek to resist uh, very bloodily, if necessary, uh, the, 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 the sort of building that we, 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 we are shown here on the edge of my village. I wouldn't like it, but that's not the situation today. Uh, we are required, obviously, to, to look at balance. Uh, and on, on balance, uh, one might have a personal view, uh, but that can't be justified by, by evidence. One's got to look at the situation based upon the, the, the evidence before us. And I know that sounds like a, a, a boring lawyer speak, uh, but I felt it, it, the, the case amongst members here, I think should, should, should be articulated. And that is that uh, uh, with some degree of reluctance, I find it absolutely clear that uh, we should uh, follow the advice and allow this, uh, allow this to be granted. Thank you, Chairman. And I would propose that as, as necessary. Do you have a seconder? So it's proposed by Councillor Shepherd, seconded by Councillor Manning. I okay. know. Oh, okay, well, just... Just let me ask, uh, is there anyone wishes to second that proposal? Councillor Parker, so you've got a proposal in the seconder that we accept the officer's recommendation. All right, Councillor Nunes, you wish to? I respect what Councillor Shepherd has just said. And clearly it was passed in January last year. Quite a lot of things have happened since then. And I think what I would reflect on is that the local plan part two talked about a mix of uses. And I would be supportive of this development if the 70% B8 was 30%. It is the height, it is the scale, it is, it is the impact on 
toaster as a gateway to toaster as a market town. And I just find it difficult to reconcile and leaving aside the traffic. I mean, I get the traffic if it's one minute or whatever. I mean, I, I get that. Um, the, the traffic is one, it, what, is an issue, but I think that's the world that we probably live in. But for me, it is the scale of the buildings, the 24 to 29 meters, particularly on the south end on the A43. And I think the CPRE mentioned a number of things in their objections, but the lack of landscaping within the site, the height of the buildings. In my view, this goes against the spirit of the local plan part two. You know, we talked in there very much about a mix of uses, B2 to B3 and B8. We didn't exclude B8, and that was a big mistake, and I accept that. Um, but it was not 70%. And in the best will in the world, this is 70% allocation to B8 is over the top and the heights are over the top. Um, and I just don't think it is appropriately located in relation to the market town of Toaster. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could ask Rebecca Knight uh, to respond to Councillor Manners' uh, uh, statement about landscaping, for example. I'm very happy to um, answer any questions. What, yeah. what exactly would you like me to cover? Well, well I read the, it, the CPRE objections I mean, were quite interesting. And, and I just thought that one of the things they stated was that there was no landscaping in the middle of the site. In other words, it, it becomes a concrete jungle in itself. Mm -hmm. And it's not appropriate to the, um, to the, to the setting close to Eastern Neston. I believe that we did give some advice in terms of the benefit of incorporating landscape within the development as well as the strategic landscape around. And of course, that would be part of the detailed applications, as I understand it, because the outline application is for the parameters and the strategic landscaping around the edges. So we've already talked about uh, Rebecca, I think you're, you're, I understand what you're saying, but we are actually giving um, the principle for the, for the massing. Yes, and indeed. it's really, it's really. I think CPRE's objection was the mass of buildings, and the height of them in relation to particularly Eastern Neston and the surrounding mm -hmm. villages and the open countryside. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think we we have to be open, and the applicant should be open. And my job has been to make sure that the landscape and visual impact assessment has been done in accordance with guidance that it does set out the significant impacts doesn't hide things and the visualizations which I think are extremely helpful which show the maximum parameters are indeed accurate so that's been my job and we've ticked all those boxes and I would just say that there are significant landscape and visual impacts and those are set out in the environmental statement um, and those should be taken into account in, in the decision in terms of planning balance. Thank you. Any other statements councillors wish to make? Councillor Stephen Hibbert. Thank you. I think I think uh, the, the principle of this development is probably something I can agree with, but I, I'm, I'm sorry I keep banging on about this um, this technical note, but uh, it, it it concerns me then about the, 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 the all the traffic studies and everything else, uh, as I've been pointed out earlier. Um, it was jointly prepared on behalf of the local and national highways authorities. So one has to assume that they had some input into this note. And it says a cumulative assessment of all the AL sites should be undertaken so that developers, the LA and the national highways can understand the impact of all the development sites on the local and wider highway network. And again, if a cumulative assessment isn't undertaken, there could be impacts to the highway network that are missed with no mitigation or funding identified for these. And it also goes on to say, um, in summary, it is considered NSTM should be used for the traffic modeling to ensure the sites are robustly assessed at a wider level, at a wider level, <laughs> that the modeling takes into account the wider schemes that are coming forward in the region Consistency of modelling for the AL sites and wider Northamptonshire development sites, and to ensure that all issues on the wider network 
are identified and mitigated. If they thought like that on the 5th of January, then the, the report would be different, surely. Um, yet we're told that they haven't changed their view. So uh, if, if we go ahead and, and uh, accept the application, I would certainly want it to be subject to a condition that we go back to those authorities and ensure that we're getting the right opinion. Through the chair, if I may. Um, so it's, it's already been explained to, to the committee that that note was, it was a draft note that's been superseded and was prepared in respect to different sites. So that's the first thing I would say about that. The second thing I would say is that both highway authorities um, have considered the cumulative impact um, assessment work that's been done in the case of AL3, which is in front of us today, um, and have concluded that it's robust. And the third thing I would say is that our own independent expert has also considered that and, and concluded that it's robust. Um, I, I repeat my advice from earlier, I think, which is that um, while it, it's a, a highly technical area, um, in an appeal situation, as, as the solicitor has already said, um, the, my advice would be that we would be um, up against it to, to, to look to hang um, a refusal on, on the basis of maybe there's a, a technical error in, a, in either a draft paper or within um, part of the, uh, the technical assessments. The overwhelming body of evidence all points towards um, an acceptable impact in, in technical terms. And therefore, the, uh, the, when we were considering all of this evidence in reaching the recommendation, um, in, in preparing the officer's report, then the recommendation was to grant planning permission. I, I, think, I think that has been established that um, in a draft note that shouldn't have been sent out, unfortunately was, um, and has been superseded, um, that the, 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 the position with, with regards to this application is that the highway authorities are both content. Right. Um, well, uh, I think we're probably coming to the end of the discussion. Uh, we do have a proposal that we go with officers' advice on this matter. That proposal has been seconded, and uh, I think it's time we put it to the vote. All those in favour? Could you just raise your hands again? Five. All those against? Four. The proposal is accepted. The application is passed. Point of order, Chairman. On the last minutes when we had a vote last occasion, uh, it's not actually recorded that there was a vote uh, and the numbers. Uh, would it be, is that convention now in, in, in the Council, or would it be recorded that there was a vote and it was 5 4 in favour? On that, I think. We just say that it's carried and no mention of the numbers. Sorry, Jay, just clarify. Yeah, so that was carried five, four, five in favour, four against. And then just on the point of clarification for the council, I understand that from the um, democratic services that, that the council just records a it was carried as opposed to a numbered vote. Um, I think there is actually um, a, an ability within the constitution. Some, Sometimes to say whether or not you want 
the vote to be recorded as the names of councillors as who voted for and against? Yes, I think any councillor can, if they want to, uh, stipulate that their particular vote is noted one way or the other. But uh, unless that happens, then I understand it's uh, it, it, not, not only is the uh, name, of, name of councillors uh, redacted or, or just not recorded, but also the, 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 the numbers not recorded in the minutes anyway. Yeah, yes. thank you. That's It's now four o'clock. I think we'll adjourn the meeting now uh, for a comfort break and to allow members to move their cars if they're in a restricted car parking space. And we'll resume at 10, 10 past four. We'll resume at 10 past four. <coughs>
Uh, we move on to agenda item six, which is land to the west of Thought and Moulton. I pass to uh, the officer, Catherine Daniels. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just share my screen. So hopefully you shall see it on the screen any minute now. So, so this is an application uh, for the construction of a new secondary school with outdoor sports facilities, access, parking, landscape and drainage. As you can see by the, I'm going too fast. Uh, as you can see by the site location plan, um, it's outside the established confines of Moulton. Moulton main village is located to the north and Northampton down to the south. These green areas are tree preservation woods and over here there's been recently TPO'd group of trees. The purple lines which surround the site here are public footpaths. So they actually encompass the whole site. The site is actually within a green space or green wedge. Um, it's not located within the conservation area. However, sort of with the trees you can see there. Within the photos, which you'll see later in the presentation, that the field has been informally used for the purposes of dog walkers using the footpath network which surrounds the site on all boundaries. The school will be an eight form entry school and will house up to 1,200 pupils between the ages of 11 and 16. The main building, as you can see here, is located to the north of the site. The nearest residential property is to which is more immediately impacted by the development is here along Ashley Lane. And sort of the main building itself is a W shape. So the main frontage building runs along the frontage with Thorpeville, which runs along here. And then you've got three elements running off the back. The overall building will be two storeys in height. So these are the existing floor plans or the proposed floor plans. So you can see this, these are the elevation profiles of the proposed building. So a typical well, sort of school development at the moment. Um, you would see, yeah, it's two stories in height. The, the highest part is the element which will serve the gymnasium. There have been several concerns raised about on this application, such as the need for the school for the lo this location, as it is due to serve Northampton and its SUEs. The applicants have demonstrated that there is not an alternative location suitable for the new secondary school in time for it to open in 2023, where there's, a, there's evidence of a severe need for secondary school places they considered 34 different site locations surrounding the site. These are the proposed highway improvement works, which have been agreed between the applicants and the highway authority, such as improvement of the footpath network to Ashley Lane and creating a zebra crossing over Thorpeville. And again, these are the pictures or improvement works with Parkview and Overstone Road. So there again, there'll be a new pedestrian zebra crossing. There will be impacts on sort of the character and appearance of the locality, obviously, because it's in within the green wedge. It is in the open countryside. So obviously there will be a change. What you've got to consider is whether that change can, is acceptable, um, which as officers, we consider that, there, that the development can be made acceptable by even by imposition of conditions and further negotiations with the applicants, which are still ongoing to either bolster up the existing hedgerows and replace those hedgerows which potentially are going to be lost as a result of the entrance and exits to the site.
but yet there are further negotiations which are ongoing, but these can be accommodated and can be made acceptable. Ecology concerns have also been raised. Again, these are still ongoing negotiations with our ecologist. And again, it's considered that these impacts can be overcome. Residential amenity is another one that has been raised as a concern because obviously it's a green field. It's sort of relatively little impact on residential amenity, especially of those along Thorpeville and more or more likely Ashley Lane, and especially the nearest neighbour, number 74. However, with the, again, with the imposition of conditions, it is considered that the impacts can be made acceptable and that there will be no resulting overlooking. If I go to the uh, site plan, which is at the top of the slide, or I can use this one, as you can see, there is a footpath or and a complex car park here, which will be a one-way system going around the site and back out um, to provide drop-off spaces for the children for, for the morning. So the neighbour, which is located here, will also potentially have the bin stores here, but that is over 60 metres away. So even though there will be an impact, it's considered that that impact is not sufficient to warrant refusal of this application on based on that alone. The main issue which has been raised as a concern, like many other developments of this type, is highways. Highways have raised concerns and the most up to date response can be seen within the update sheet. The applicants have worked with the highways and have agreed several measures, such as what I've showed you before. The main issue, which is that, that is unlikely to be resolved, is the model information that has been submitted as part of the application, such as the measures in which um, how students will get to the school itself. There is a perceived acknowledgement that there will be a harm to the highway network as a result of the provision of the school. However, this, the, the impact on the highway network is not severe. The highway authority, even though has got concerns of the proposed development, have not raised an objection based on severity. However, the benefits of providing a much needed secondary school for opening in 2023 is considered significant. And the impacts on the school or impacts of the school on the highway network are considered to be outweighed by this significant benefit. There are still ongoing negotiations with the applicant on certain matters. And at the moment, there are no specific conditions agreed. However, they are still so there are conditions in the pipeline, but they have not overall been agreed in by the applicant or officers. However, that is part of the recommendation. The recommendation overall has been altered from the main report following further negotiation since when the report was written. So then this is shown within the updates in your packs before members. Overall, the, it is considered the development should be allowed subject to sorting out ecology, landscaping and surface water drainage. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Before we invite the speakers to come forward, I'll ask if any members got any questions or facts of the officer before we get into that. Anybody got any questions on that? No, if you're not going to, I will. Um, you, you mentioned the Pelican crossings or crossings or whatever. Are they actually light, con light controlled or are they just... They're separate crossings. So. Oh, okay, they're not light controlled. No. I was just thinking from a safety point of view for the children, that was all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at all? If not, we'll... Yeah, can, can I just... Can you just clarify? Certainly, John. 
I'm, I'm paging up now the supplement. Um, within that, is it just point me towards where the actual recommendation, the revised recommendation is in the supplement? I'm it's looking. it's at it's at the end, so it's the what it's the last page for this item, um, just before uh, number seven. It's page sixteen. I, to be honest, I haven't got the num numbers oh, yeah, in front I got, of me. I got it. New, rec new headed new recommendation. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Any any questions on that, Councillor Shepherd, or are you happy with that? Okay, thank you. Right, we're now moving to the speakers. And first up, I believe it's Chris Oakes. So I'd like to come forward, take your seat. Yeah, if you pull one of the microphones closer to you, if you don't bring it closer, they don't pick up very well. Um, and if you press the button at the bottom in the middle, you will get a red light. Yep, okay. There, there, one of these. Yes, there's a three minute marker on my left, so that's fine. So you have three minutes, sir. Okay, I'm Chris Oakes. I'm the resident of 74 Ashley Lane, the house actually on the field. I have two major concerns based on which I would wish to object to the current plans as they stand. The current plan, the first is ecological. The current plan proposes a school park, car park, being placed close to the trees on the perimeter of our garden of 74 Ashley Lane, particularly a large sycamore tree that has pr tree protection order on it. If the car park is built as planned, it is likely to damage our tree roots and may affect the foundations of our house. And this could clearly make whoever takes or approves the action liable for any damage. Second is the impact on our privacy and amenity. Before this proposal, the nearest you could physically be to our house to overlook was Thorpeville, the old A43, behind the hedge that runs alongside the field. The field was for agricultural use and planted with wheat, not as it's been shown on these pictures. No one entered the field. The council terminated the farmer's lease and the use effectively changed from agricultural to leisure as dog walkers are now allowed to walk around the field. This was done without any planning change being approved. We complained to the council on the 30th of March 2021 to ask about the change of the use of the dog walkers were technically trespassing on the field and were able to walk very close and past our house and dogs regularly come into our garden. Despite our objections to senior officers in the council, nothing was done. You'll see in the report that the officers have argued our amenity will not be affected as dog walkers currently go past our house and garden. However, this is only possible if the use is designated recreational, otherwise it should not be the case. As we argued, a change of use was never agreed. This means the decision today is one that will change our amenity as the current position described by the officers is not an agreed or legal use of the land. The fact that the dog walkers trespassing and effect illegally on our field cannot, we argue, be used as an argument that our amenity is not being substantially affected. If these plans are approved, people will be able to view into the large picture window of our bedroom from six metres rather than 50. This includes allowing or encouraging school children or teenagers to look into our bedroom where we change. Finally, the current plans include a 2.5 high metre fence to be erected directly in the boundary of our garden. I believe several members of the committee have visited the field and have seen the perimeter of our garden. The current plans will reside in our hedge at the side of our house, being damaged or destroyed, and the conifer at the end of the garden being the same. The action will further remove our amenity, making it feel like a prison. I would highlight my wife has ongoing mental health issues, will be considered a disability, and I don't think an equality impact assessment has been completed. We'd ask that the car park is built further away from the perimeter to safeguard our amenity and protect the foundations of our house and trees. And most importantly, the steel fence is moved away from our perimeter to at least three to five metres. I'd ask that these plans are developed in dialogue with ourselves, and we would ask that the decision making is not delegated and comes back to the planning committee. Great timing, Mr. Oakes. If you'd like to remain seated, of any members of questions directly of the uh, Mr. Oakes, anybody? Okay, thank you, sir. I invite Mr. Roger Cooper to come forward and speak. Do you want to remove your mask to speak? Or? Yes, of course. Just make it easier for us. That was all. 
So thank you, sir. You, when you're ready, we will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. We fully recognise there is a need for a new secondary school in this area within the developing Northampton North SUE and surrounds. However, the responses from residents this application is 100 to 1 against it being cited as proposed. This is an overwhelming expression of wish by the local population and should not be ignored. Remember, the Brexit vote was only 51 to 49. A sighting within the 3,600 home SUE would be far more suitable with an appropriate design road system that is fit for purpose. Due to the restriction I'm putting our case to you, I'm making my comments on behalf of the 99% of residents who have expressed their opposition to this application. The papers in front of you do not contain any of the extensive contents of our case for rejection, only 14 bullet points without any supporting details. Despite having tried to get updated information for some months now, nothing has been available to view by consultees until 18th and 19th January, allowing only four working days for perusal, with 17 new documents and almost 600 pages to read, understand and digest. This must have been an almost impossible task for all members of this committee, alongside their other duties and the time available. I've personally spent many long hours doing this, and it's quite evident this application is still lacking many vital details, such as those pertaining to transport and traffic matters, which are woefully lacking or conflicting in content, and where there's still a total impasse between highways and the applicant. The fire evacuation provisions still do not accord with the required legal fire safety standards. Perimeter site fencing security, as proposed, remains totally inadequate to protect this multi-million pound facility. Ecology matters relating to the provision of dark corridors as required for wildlife habitats are still not confirmed. The parking provisions are not in accord remaining. with the modal transport needs of the school. The use of Mooga pitches for anything up to 22 hours per day, as stated in the application, is totally unrealistic and is wholly inappropriate for the quiet enjoyment of local residents. Similarly, the proposal to re removal of the green zone, which was only introduced in 2020, to halt the coalescing of Malton into Greater Northampton is without any merits whatsoever. And the extensive use of reduction in most reports is, we believe, wholly unjustified, what is being hidden from view. In conclusion, we would therefore ask that the period of consultation with all stakeholders in this process, including local residents, should be extended appropriately following full resolution of all outstanding matters with the applicant. I would therefore respectfully suggest nothing be decided by this committee today until each and every one of these important outstanding matters are fully and satisfactorily resolved. Equally, we firmly believe that into all these matters of such vital importance are adequately resolved and until further consultation with all interested stakeholders in this proposal is completed, this committee should not be put in the invidious and constitutionally damaging position of giving away their democratic powers by delegating this decision to any officer of the council under any circumstances. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. If you remain seated for a second, do any members of the committee have a question for Mr. Cooper? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I now call upon Councillor Aarons, Moulton Parish Council. Come forward, please. Thank you. When you're comfortable, you have three minutes now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Morton Parish Council. I don't propose to address the details of what we consider a very flawed planning application. You've heard two of our speakers today, and there are other residents who have gone into a great deal more detail and documented their objections to various aspects of this application. What I would like to address is the issue of the strategy supposedly underlining this proposal and its impact on the community's concern, not just Moulton. So I do have some observations and a final request regarding process. This application was predicated on the need for additional school places within the former borough of Northampton. However, 
the site selected is beyond the town boundaries in the nearby village of Moulton. This will lead to the need to transport typically hundreds of children from the town of Northampton to the northeast to the adjacent village. This will be primarily by personal motor transport. There will be no financial provision for busing, as I understand the, DF, the DFES have not provided such funds. And we already have to deal with a diminishing public transport network uh, in over the last few years, the, the timetabling of buses coming to and from Moulton has been reducing gradually. Moulton already has the further education college, a secondary school and a primary school. It has no need. And to be fair, it's not being offered additional education provision. Just across the A43, your predecessor councils established the SUE of something like three and a half thousand new homes. Originally, this was to have its own secondary education permission, uh, provision. It does no longer so. There seems to be a little joined up thinking here, and we're dealing with a project in danger of pleasing absolutely no one. Once the decision's been made, you'll move on to other business, understandably and we'll be leaving these communities to deal with the long-term consequences. We've been given barely any time to read and digest the 16 or so reissued documents comprising some 600 pages, documents which had non-existent change control. So it was really difficult to figure out what had changed and what was new. Your officers work full-time for West North Ends, but local residents and councillors have to fit these things in, in between their real lives. Mr. Newton's response to Councillor Cribbin leaves me with a strong impression that getting it done, to paraphrase our national leader, to a deadline is actually more important than getting it right. A decision with such important consequences needs to be taken by this body of councillors, not with delegated powers passed to those anxious to do it and move on. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Councillor Aarons. Has anybody got any questions for the councillor? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I don't know whether you're the right person to ask, because I've just been looking, obviously you know your patch. Um, it seems that there's a, a quite a bit of landlocked farmland created Do, how, how is it farmed and will they still get access to those other fields the fields surrounding the fields sitting behind this proposed site are primarily the crowfields nature reserve right uh, which was established mm. some years ago by the parish council and is owned by the parish council right and the footpaths generally surround it so the access mm. to those is, is from other parts of the village as well and okay. via those footpaths so like this field over here the... Excuse me, Chair. So that's the site. Uh, no, the nature to... reserve is this area. Yes. Here. So I, I don't know about the ownership of that one. Okay. So I suggest the officer the... shares. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll share the, the site plan with the rest of the committee if that's all right. It's the field to the southwest right of that site. Sorry, I should have asked on the site, is it? <laughs> I, I, I think the planners are probably better placed to answer that question than I am. Don't, don't hold things up. I don't, if you, I, that right. case officer's there. Thank so you. it's that brown field yes. that we're talking about. Does that get access somewhere else? It, the, the sort of this land, this is the application yeah. site. So there are properties along there. So in effect, it will pretty much become landlocked as a result because the playing fields are over in this sort of location. <coughs> yeah, you've got a field gate here, 
and you've got the public footpath which runs along the edge here so so i was wondering you know is that access at the bottom will that be also does that have to of necessity be a farm access or what happens to that field at the bottom it was just a thought to be honest i don't have that answer i'm afraid Is there not an access to the northwest of that field? Just trying to quickly look at Google Maps. And... No? There appears to be some road in the northwest of that comes up adjacent to that field. I, if I may, Chair, I have a feeling that that field is probably within the Northampton town bound rather than the the Malton Parish boundary. Okay. Because it, it wiggles around in that area quite a lot. Okay. Catherine, are you there? Oh, you weren't. I thought you would show it again. <laughs> all right. Thank you anyway, sir. Am I done? Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. So I now invite Ward Councillor. Warren to come forward and speak, please. You know the routine, sir. You know the routine. Okay, good afternoon, members. Uh, I'm here today to inform you of the concerns that I and the community in general of Moulton have with this planning application. We are not against the application in principle, but we feel that due process has not been followed. There are still far too many outstanding issues to be addressed. Removal of the school security fence on the roadside, oh, I apologise, um, I need to just go forward a bit further. Um, the committee report mentions highways and environmental issues to be resolved. I have been advised to request that these and other outstanding issues be highlighted and conditioned so that the committee can consider them at a later date. The issues I would wish to be highlighted and conditioned are one, the temporary construction entrance to be moved beyond the coppice of trees. This we have been told has been agreed, but again, this does not appear on any of the drawings I have seen. Two, the removal of the school security fence on the roadside of Thorpeville along the coppice of trees. We have been told that this has been considered in and in principle agreed, but again, nothing has been written down. Moving the security fence and bin maintenance store area away from the house at the bottom of Ashley Lane. We have been told that officers are in negotiation with residents and I can have been told and assured that this has not happened. Nothing has been reported back to them. Please can this be conditioned that a satisfactory compromise be reached with the resident. Surely there are other places on this site to place a bin and maintenance area to avoid any annoyance. There needs to be some thought also to move into security fence as far away as is possible to re reduce the stark effect of the security fencing to this property. The committee report mentions also both highways and environmental issues, which are still outstanding. I would request away. that these issues be, need to be explored and satisfactorily resolved in collaboration with the local members prior to any final decision being made. I appreciate that we are not going to get a total consensus on everything, but the local community feel that their voice has not been heard and they have not had the opportunity to be engaged in this decision, which is going to have a major impact on the local area. Finally, I would also note that the advice to grant permission today with delegated authority be given to officers to finalize the outstanding issues. Officers should not be making the final decisions on this significant application. It should be the elected members of the planning committee this committee should not be abdicating its responsibility to make the final decisions on this application. Thank you for listening to me today. And I ask that you consider the, the considerable concerns of the local community 
so that we can work together and resolve these issues and hopefully produce a plan that is acceptable to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ron, if you remain seated. Any questions from the members of the committee? Councillor Warren? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I now invite Councillor Daniel Lister to uh, come forward, thank you. Three minutes when you're comfortable. Mr Chairman, members, um, I'm addressing the committee today in my role as a Cabinet Member for Education, Assistant Cabinet Member for Education. In West North Ants, we are about to hit a crisis point. We do not have enough secondary school places. The opening of this proposed new school in September 2023, along with its 240 additional places, will be essential to WNC's ability to meet its statutory obligations of providing a sufficiency of secondary school places in the Northampton area for the 23-24 academic year and beyond. We have a projected current shortfall of 150 places, potentially increasing to 200 from 23-24, an additional 200 the following year. We have already created over 200 additional places year on year through financial incentive and goodwill within current schools to ensure we have sufficient capacity. This is currently costing the authority over 1.3 million pounds per year and increasing year on year. This is not conducive to good education for our children as we cram more and more people onto our current sites. To build a single form entry building alone for 30 children on an existing site will cost the authority in excess of 4.5 million pounds. The additional capacity provided by the new school would completely mitigate against this deficit of places and ensure the secondary schools are able to provide a small amount of surplus capacity for students moving into the area from September 2023 onwards. The Department for Education will not at this point entertain moving the proposed new school to an alternative site. The design time alone for a new school takes 18 months. They've already invested over a million pound into this site and in all likelihood any further delay would mean a complete withdrawal by them. In relation to transport to and from school, the authority has a school transport policy, which means that should a child be allocated a space at this school and lives more than three miles, that's defined as walking distance, there will be allocated transport paid for by the authority with further concessions on distance to those with special educational needs. I hear the concerns of the residents and would ask if the committee are to put in any measures, remaining. such as not delegating authority to officers to alleviate these community issues, that we ensure these do not hinder the deadline of September 2023. Any delay to a September 2023 opening of the proposed new school would result in a clear, immediate and certain failure of WNC to deliver its statutory obligations in this regard and in severe reputational damage. I must stress the absolute urgency of this application requests that you today approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lister. Uh, stay there a second. Uh, any members got a question of the councillor? Yes, Penny. Could you tell me, please, where the pupils are actually coming from for this school with regard to the Northampton? Uh, well, they'll come, we, they have an oversubscribed junior school at Moulton already, um, but they, they, they can come from anywhere within Northampton, but the preference is down to the admissions policy of the school, and those local should be given preference to that school. I don't have the current where the actual deficit of places are spread by household, if that's the question you're asking. Sorry, could I just go back to what you just said? You said they can come from anywhere Correct. in Northampton. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a school admissions policy. Well, there will be a school admissions policy that says there'll be, you know, if you're um, uh, got a disability, for instance, you will have entrance first. Then, if you've got, um, these are just standard disabilities, then siblings, and then you do it on distance based on for a typical academy or a local authority school. So, there is no um, mileage concerned in this so many miles away and all that sort of thing there there isn't for any school i mean my kids go to a school 30 miles away well, for that's instance. why i asked you yes if i may yes. where you were thinking the pupils would come from to go to Moulton. well they would come from there's uh, the new development at overston that's got five thousand houses on it um what, sorry there's a new development at overston that has five thousand houses scheduled to be built on it but there's additional houses that are being you know, built and obviously people from you know the, the, the closer the people that go to schools currently in further away schools in northampton it's in their interest to go to the closest school in Moulton. thank you and 
the proposals of getting these children to the school? Mm -hmm. So anyone that lives over three miles away in the school transport policy is entitled to free if they're allocated as place at that school they're entitled to free school transport paid for by the authority thank you and if they're on free school things like have a disability and things like that there are further concessions that's defined as walking distance you know it's a standard one so if there's not you know it won't be you know a big tranche of cars coming in from 10 miles away every day Fine. thank you very much yes councillor heron on, on, on the obviously um it will be very logical for it to be serving the, that large development at, at Overstone that you mentioned. But they've got a, ha, we've shown um, a zebra crossing over the minor road to the school. How are they going to get over the dual carriageway? I think that's a question for someone on planning. <laughs> uh, I can get the, the officer to answer that. I do know the answer, but I'll get the officer to answer that. Do you want to answer it now? I can answer that. There is going to be, there's a number of pedestrian crossings already proposed or will be built. Um, if I can share my screen again, um, I can show you sort of the locations of, of those crossing points. Those will be actually, con as um, the chairman asked, obviously about the um, zebra crossings, which were just zebra cross lines in the road, these will be controlled, presumably, yes, because, yes. Of the, the, because of the weight of traffic. Yes, so there is going to be a crossing point over here. So this is where the avenue is, which leads onto Thorpeville here. And there's also a further crossing point up here, which is already built um, and in operation here as well. And again, I believe there is some over on the north side here, near the sort of the shell garage. So I do think there are three light controlled ones. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you. Yes, I think this is probably a couple of questions for the case officer, in fact, but I, I wondered, uh, I think of children uh, walking, cycling uh, within three miles or, or getting, being, uh, get, getting a bus place, if not, if they live further away. Uh, where is the uh, nearest air quality management area? Uh, I think that's, do, do we want to leave that until the case officer at the end of this? I okay. think that's beyond the remit of okay. uh, the board councillor. <laughs> no offence. Councillor Hewitt. Uh, <clears throat> does the three mile rule force the provision of a bus service or is it simply a question that they get free bus services on the current provision they will put on bus service uh, uh, that the requirement service yes they'd have to be the required so it will be dedicated school transport so it will say you know there's a pickup area in wherever it is you know this location and we will take you to the front of the school so they have to provide the the, 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 the amount of place on the buses Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dan, I hear and understand the strategic need for the school. I get that. What's disappointing is that we, have, we haven't tied up the loose ends that I would have expected us to have tied up before coming to this committee. And I'm not sure if that's directed at you or to the planning or to the applicant. I'm not sure. It's a general statement. I, it is disappointing to have, and particularly to have the comments made by the other, other, other speakers. What is your deadline? What is the drop dead deadline for getting this in terms of, and so what, and in terms of date, if we were potentially to defer this? We have to be open by September, 2023. And unless we start building imminently, it won't be open in time for September 2023. So it's, it's moved so far back already because it was already due to go in front of committee, I think in October and then in December, and we're now in January that we've lost all of the leeway that we've got. So do you, do you feel comfortable with the way that the applicant has dealt with the local issues and the local concerns? From an educate, I mean, I'm, I'm not a planner, but well, I'm on this planning committee, but I think it's, I think it would be wise for... No, as, as, as a cabinet, assistant cabinet, are you happy with the way that it's been dealt with and processed? Yes. I'm surprised by that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor James. Yeah. 
the figure you mentioned about the short fall in spaces, is that Northampton or is that, you know, throughout West North End? That's the Northampton area only. And it was 100 and 150 this year, potentially increased to 190, 200, depending on, on the numbers, because we do have some, we've had a lot of movement out um, through COVID and European, so we expect it to go up slightly, especially with new house building, and then 200 the following year. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because it doesn't seem to be a number that couldn't be accommodated in temporary provision for a short time, because I don't see how we're going to get the school built and ready and open by September 23. Well, they're, they're, I mean, we've already used up all of our additional bulge capacity. So we, we have bulge capacity within schools and we say to different schools, you know, if we'll pay you some money, will you take on additional pupils? And we've done that to all of the schools that we can do. Um, there's the consideration that they may put on temporary schooling at the current site, but that would have to be within an agreement from the trust and I don't think they'll do that because it just isn't very good. It'll mean changes to the plans and the building process. There isn't anywhere else to, we haven't got anywhere else to put additional capacity effectively. I'm surprised that I... We've used it or we've been pushing it down the road for so long. We haven't got any, uh, yeah, we haven't got any space left. Many years ago, when I passed 11 plus and I was going to Trinity Grammar School in Northampton, Trinity High School as it was then, the school wasn't built in time. So they took the entire lot of us, four form, and bunged us all in Northampton College of Technology down at Jewel Road. I spent 12 years in that tech college down there. I'm quite sure we, you know, push come to shove that that, that could be done again with, with other... I mean, you know, we could transport people all over the county for school. I mean, I'm sure we can find school places in Brackley or somewhere. But again, it's not a sensible way of planning school places to have, you know, people traveling 60, 70 mile round trips to, to, to schools every morning, plus the cost of school transport that we'd have to put on. So to, you know, for five years of school transport for, a, for an intake of this size in 2023 would cost us uh, 500, 300,000 to 500,000 pounds per year um, in transport alone. So I mean, you know, we're not saying there's no school places in you know, other areas. We're saying there's not sufficient capacity within the Northampton area to be able to take all of the children within a reasonable distance for them to be able to go to school. Excuse me, can we speak into the microphone, please? I don't yeah. think everybody's I'm appreciate. not against the school being built on this site because I, I don't think it's reasonable to oppose a school there. But I do think those issues that have been raised need to be resolved. And, um, you know, it, Councillor Manners uh, asked, you know, what's your deadline date? And I, I think it was right to do that because, you know, I, I would suggest we don't want to get into a situation like that business we've just dealt with in the previous application. But I, I wondered if we could actually put a very short deadline on that to get some resolution. It's likely to be impossible. I don't know. But to try and get some and then come back to the committee with a recommendation and we have to make a decision on it. I mean, I think the DfE have indicated that they will likely pull the plug if we delay any further. But what I would suggest is, you know, approve the application and put conditions on that. These things, you know, let, we can still get moving and start digging ground and things like that. And actually, you know, put some conditions on it for it to return to committee so that these things can be resolved as opposed to rejecting it outright. We need to move okay. forward at this point. Point. Yeah, yeah, I'm not suggesting they reject it. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, I think, absolutely. yeah, I've got, no, we've got no objection. Our deadline is September 2023. We, we, you know, we acknowledge, and I hear the community uh, issues around some of the things with the highways and the boundaries and the transport and all those other things, and that's not beyond the realms of us and as a committee or as the planners or anyone else to resolve those issues. Yeah. But we can get on with doing the preparation <laughs> of building this school so that we can start building in 2023-24, well, oh, sorry, so we can have it ready for the 2023-24 intake, and that's our concern. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Heron again. It's just a comment that it feels rather irksome that the West North Hans Council is being pushed into making this decision, actually, because of failings of NCC to do things in a timely manner just make a point. I don't disagree. <laughs>
Thank you, Councillor Lister. Right, I now invite Michelle Davis and Mark Romanowski. Are you coming? Are you coming together or not? No, you're leaving them there. Okay. Thank you, Three minutes when you're ready. Mark's available to answer questions. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm planning agent for the application, and um, I just wanted to talk about weight to be given to the need for school places, which obviously the council have preceded me has gone through. Um, but just to confirm the information that we pulled together from both the council and the Department for Education when we were pulling the planning submission together was that since 2019, 802 secondary school places have been accommodated in temporary accommodation and existing schools throughout the area. And this demand is only going to keep going. So you've already got 802 places that have been accommodated in a, in a temporary fashion. And the pressure is going to keep rising. So the demand that exists from September 2023 is 242 secondary school places. And at present, there is nowhere for these pupils to be accommodated. 58% um, of that demand, I'm told, is from the three postcodes which include and surround the application site. So it is a generalised need and a localised need. I think the other point I would make in terms of catchment area, and, I, and I'm not from the Education Authority, I'm, I'm a town planner, but this school will meet a need arising as a result of planned housing um, contained within the joint core strategy. So the Overstone housing that we've uh, been talking about, which is the other side of the A43, is 3,200 new homes. It's likely that in reality, as the school grows, because obviously in the first year, only year sevens will go in and it will grow year on year, the catchment area will in effect reduce because it will become a local school for local children, um, many of whom will live in that new housing. Just in terms of process, it's not for me to comment on council process and officers may want to, to talk about this as well. I would just say that in terms of the loose ends um, that, that need to be tied up, the majority of those have in effect been tied up since the committee report was written. So for example, um, the construction access has been moved away from the cops. Um, the fencing around the resident has been um, moved inwards away from the boundary. Um, I don't think there's been a specific conversation about the bin store, I'll be honest. Um, but many of the issues that we're talking about are not issues that go to the heart of the permission or to the heart of the decision making here. The, the principle of this development on a green wedge is acceptable under policy um, in that local policy talks about meeting a clearly identified local need, which this does. The other last point I'll make is that I've heard the word used twice, um, impasse with the highways authority. In actual fact, we've worked really well with the highway authority and I think both parties have, you know, there's been give and take in terms of the position and the highway authority Ten seconds is remaining. now of the view that the, the harm arising from um, this scheme does not outweigh the significant public benefits. Um, and obviously there have been a number of improvements offered uh, by the applicants through the process to the local highway network. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle's uh, obviously available for questions and members, but as I uh, pertain to Mark Romanowski at the back is a transport consultant. Do you want to come forward in case there's some questions for yeah. you as well? Because I have a feeling there will, will be some transport consultation questions, I guess, from members. So members now have the chance to ask questions of these. So Councillor Herring was the first with her hand up. Um, I th it may have been um, addressed in the updates, but I'm not sure. But on uh, item 8.35, um, it says the local highways authority has requested a three metre combined footpath and cycle path along the entire frontage of the proposed development, the applicants are not willing to provide this. It, is that still the case or is that actually been, is that a, an issue that has been resolved? As I understand, that's, uh, that has been resolved. Councillor Madders. Um, thank you, Chair. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> um, on page 12, 
of um, the planning officer's um, supplementary information. It says the LHA's position is largely as per that set out in the previous formal response. But they must advise the local planning authority there's significant concerns over the impact of the development proposal on the surrounding highway network. The LHA maintains that some of the assumptions of mode share and public transport are unrealistic. That just gives me cause for concern that the loose ends haven't really been tied up. I, I, I try to give me some confidence. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, in terms of process, I think we want to understand what conditions we can put on this um, going forward. I'll take the start of that in a non-technical way, because I think um, rather than a loose end, it is a difference in professional judgment. So the issue is um, in terms of the assumptions about how many pupils may travel to the school, either on foot or by bus, as opposed to car. Mark has an opinion. The highway authority has a different opinion. So it's not really a loose end. It is a um, position that we differ on. So as I was saying before, that, that's partly to do with the catchment area. It, we think that the, the logical position here must be that as housing in that area grows at that rate, it will be primarily local children who will be walking to the school. So that, that, it, that's the non-technical way of explaining the difference. Yeah, so I'm not going to take that up. Um, I mean, we, uh, we used a... Um, specific methodology that, that, uh, that was agreed and actually put forward by uh, by the highway authority to um, uh, to outline the percentage of those pupils that would be coming by car to the school um, that is the it's uh, the census information for for other schools in the Northampton area so that was how we developed our um, our sort of percentage split of those pupils that would come by car if that helps. Not really. I mean, I mean, what concerns me is that there's an impasse between you and the local highway. Who, who, who am I meant to believe? Who's the expert in travel? Um, well, well, we're obviously both. Ex well, we're both experts in our own um, in that field. Um, I mean, uh, there could well be more conversation that needs to be had. But I mean, um, obviously, the councillor before us did mention that the um, in terms of a bus service. Uh, sort of potentially being provided which uh, which would certainly help to um to sort of reduce the number of pupils coming by car which actually was one of the uh, the issues that i think probably you raise in terms of the uh, maybe the difference of uh, sort of opinions with the uh, with the highway authority um, so hopefully that will uh, you know having that bus service will um, hopefully reduce uh, that percentage of pupils needing to come by car because the original um, papers suggested there was no bus service is that right? Uh, yes, I understand so that. The, I mean, logic, the logic is increase the capacity of the buses, the bus service, mm -hmm. find a solution so that actually it doesn't antagonise all the residents. Mm -hmm. um, Brackley do it very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not beyond the wit of man, this, and I'm mm -hmm. just disappointed again that this has come to this point, this committee, mm -hmm. the fact that these points are unresolved. I think in terms of the way that free schools operate, and obviously this is a, an, an application by the Department for Education, ultimately by the Secretary of State, is that the, the funding revenue does not extend to public to bus provision. So it will be incumbent upon the free school itself, once established, to ensure that there is a bus service that pupils can access the, the school. So that might sound like I'm pushing it down the line, but it's that's the process in terms of the Department for Education are funding the provision of a new building. <laughs> Um. Councillor Heron. I can't help but say you might be an expert in highways, but you not, might not be an expert in persuading teenagers to go out on a bike for a three mile when it's pouring with rain or freezing cold. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Kevin, thank, thank you. Councillor Shepherd. Uh, when, when we first heard that North London School for Boys was going to operate, obviously we were, I think, quite pleased. Uh, the fact of the matter, as, as I understand it, they've not had a great deal of impact, input uh, into where we are today. I, for example, we, we heard earlier that there's an admissions policy uh, not yet published, publicised. The travel to school is linked in inexorably with an admissions policy. We, Councillor Lister confirmed, I think, 
I hope you really confirm that as well, uh, that uh, it is largely, or that, that it will rather not mitigate against uh, people, kids in the molten SUE, three and a half thousand hours. So they will have an automatic opportunity, which of course is not the case with Northampton School for Boys currently. That's, they, they've got a quasar, they've got quite a, a, a selective admissions policy. So, I mean, that, uh, we were pleased to hear that, and I'm sure you can, you can confirm that. But, of course, you're not speaking on behalf of NSB. You're, you're speaking on behalf of DfE, which is a slight difficulty. Coming on to the, uh, the, the, the nub, uh, it, I think it's, it's, it, it's probably relieving to think uh, that uh, as the SUE grows, and we saw the photographs, it, there's nothing there at the moment, or very little. As the SUE grows, uh, the, the, the greater preponderance of children wanting to come, obviously, from the SUE. One specific information question. Do, do you have a figure for uh, how many uh, 11 to 16-year-olds are gener generated per 1,000 houses? Do, do you have that, roughly? Well, no, but I would think that a reasonable assumption on the 3,200 houses is that they're probably a fairly good range of properties in terms of bedroom yep. size. I would think a reasonable a reasonable estimate, you'd say, would maybe 50% of those houses would have one or two children, <coughs> would generate one or two children of secondary school age throughout, you know, going forward. Yeah, so, so you, you could... That's not, that's just yeah. a common sense assumption. Yeah, so you could, you could expect a, a very large proportion of the uh, students to come from the Moulton SUE. Uh, and so a very large portion would be within, uh, in the travel plan, uh, the area that we see as cycle or walking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and going slightly further than that, uh, we see the travel plan, I've got two problems with the travel plan. The travel plan is to be reviewed every year for five years. That does not make sense. You know, you want you want the travel plan to be reviewed every year. Full stop. Carry on and on and on. Not not just stop. Not just stop in five years' time. So, you know, I'd like you please, to, you know, whoever's right, written the travel plan, to, to think about that. It, it's got to be re renewed indefinitely. And secondly, it provides for 120 cycle racks for 1,200 pupils. Now, I agree that's 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 on a a pricey of 10%. Uh, so that that and it also there's a provision for that to be reviewed as need grows. So you're, you're nodding, hopefully you can sort of, we can incorporate that in somebody's plan. And of course it's gonna be an SB's plan, it's not gonna be your plan, because it's gonna be the school for boys who are gonna to have to implement the travel plan. So you, we, we, it's important to condition properly the travel plan and the review of the travel plan and, and the review of looking at cycle places uh, and encourage uh, all the students coming from the Moulton SUE to walk or to bicycle. Yeah, I mean, I bicycle to school from age six till, till 18. You know, it's not difficult. Um, th th thank you. I think that's... Uh, that, that, that's could, I, could I just come back on the point about the Northampton School for Boys? Um, I know that this school is, is, there is not a selective admissions policy. I don't know about the other school, but this will be a, a school for any child in Northampton, but the, going forward, it will it will contract down. Um, but just also, we've worked with them really closely. Um, they're here today that we have had, so they've helped design the building. They've had massive input into its internals, what they need, what things need to be, how things work. There's been, there's been areas of disagreement on that where, you know, we've, we've had to um, make sure that they get what they want. So they, yes, the applicant is the DFE, but the, the school itself has been really closely involved in the development of the site. And, they are also aware of the contents of the travel plan and you know we'll commit to that. I think the five point one is a is a fair one. Um, but yeah, they, they are they are very um, involved in the scheme. Thank you. Any further questions from our two speakers? If not, thank you for your presentations. You return to your seats, thank you. Right, before we uh, commence the open debate. I look to the case officer if she wants to come back on anything that's been said so far uh, during this um, long speaker section. Over thank to you, you, Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I know the question about air quality zones 
one thing is I'm not aware of the ones in the borough, but I have done a search and I can't find anything near sort of the application site. Um, there are none within the former Daventry District Council's area, as I'm aware. Um, in regards to sort of the impasse uh, between sort of the highway authority and the applicant's um, own sort of side of things, yeah, there's an impasse because yes, th there's been a lot of agreement, but there's one bone of contention which has been raised by sort of the Michelle, the consultant, um, just now. However, as an officer, we've got to weigh up the benefits against the harm caused. And we consider, or the officer myself considers, the benefits of providing the school outweighs that harm. And the uh, in future, it's been seen that the uh, school is going to be providing more of a local need, um, sort of especially with the SUEs being developed immediately surrounding the site pretty much. Thank you, Catherine. Right, I now open the floor to debate this application. Who wants to open on this one? Councillor Parker. Thank you, Chair. Um, just through to the case officer. We talked about the uh, the payment and it was been agreed now. It was two different approaches, but, but previous people said, yes, it's been resolved. Which way has it been resolved? If you have a look here within sort of the late reckoning, sort of the updates on page 13, it highlights um, sort of the highway improvements which have been agreed, which includes new zebra crossing on Thorpeville near to the site entrance to replace the existing pedestrian refuge. Yeah. The new zebra crossing on Overstone Road, <coughs> introduce, introduction of a new foot, footway path, three metre wide shared use on the western side of Thorpeville from directly south to the southern pedestrian access to the start of the existing footway path. Footway path widening improvement to three metre wide shared use of the existing footway on western side of Thorpeville up to the edge of the site boundary on Ashley Lane and the Parkview Overstone Road ju junction of white lining. Now, obviously, these will also will be undertaken within the highway land ownership. However, they would also need to uh, meet sort of the E278 agreements, um, which they would have to apply to as well. Thank you for that. So that's fine now. We're at three metres now. Um, when we walk around the site and we got to the house, uh, the fencing was going to be right up against the fencing. But I think you pointed out it's actually going to be set back from that. By probably, I wasn't sure how far it was going to be set back, but also it would be gated. So it wasn't like a, a rat run, for want of a better word. Could you just explain that to the committee please no if i uh, see if i can share my screen again um and then i'll uh, point out the uh, fencing plan which is on the presentation if i can get to uh, the right one <coughs> No, you, you're not allowed to address. No. Oh, that's a fair request. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Just bear with me, see if I can zoom in. Yeah, I can see if I can sort of zoom in. So if I go on. To... So around here, they, uh, there are some footpath or some, it's going to be enclosed all around. So there's going to be two entrances 
where the footpath has been moved, so it will not be used as a rat run. And that fence will be about what, a metre, metre and a half from the boundary of the house? Yes, away from the tree preservation orders. Um, but again, uh, there are still some potential issues, landscaping issues, which are still to be resolved, um, right. especially with planting and things. But there's ongoing negotiation with that. And because it's a car park, the engineering will be a lot less than if it was a road. So there be no, should be no issues regarding TPOs or trees with that distance. And again, we can condition, and you condition, condition that. that as well regarding sort of the how the hard surface is, is treated, especially around the preservation order. So we can condition that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Herring. Um, when we went on the site visit and we got to the uh, where the road has been blocked off, there was it had basically been left as a sort of heap of soil. Um, I don't know who that patch of land will belong to, but could something be done uh, about either landscaping or um, or making hard standing because it's going to be used as a gathering area. There's no doubt about it, as um, children spill out from school or access the sports fields. Whereabouts exactly was? <clears throat> it's, the, it's the sort of no man's, you know where, where the bollards were? Yes. And then we were looking towards how people would get from, from the roundabout where it's at, that, that there'll be pedestrian or cycle access from that roundabout for, for children who are coming from the Northampton oh. side. There was, there's a sort of no man's land bit of rough, land that's just a heap of soil at the that, moment yeah that's where the actual a40 sort of the old a43 was closed off um so an area which has been bollarded off um obviously yes it could be used as a congregational point um but there are footpaths which go either side of the uh, either side of that um, it's again, it's outside the uh, red line of this application, but again, it's something which we probably can take up uh, separately as it would be within the council's own ownership. So it's something that we potentially could manage in the future. Great. I think I think it, it should because it'll it's a it's a presentation of the, the whole um, school and the access to the school. So m maybe we should do something with it and then hand it over to the local local council for maintenance or something it's it's obviously it's something which i can bring to the attention of the highway authority thank you uh, next question councillor shepherd please chairman thank you i suspect most members know that uh, this is my patch this is my ward uh, which makes uh, obviously sitting on this committee that bit more challenging uh, I think rather like an earlier application, uh, on a blank sheet of paper, one would not want a school here. Uh, one would really want it uh, in the heart of, of the SUE uh, with improved walking aspects from every aspect of the SUE where, where there'd be no question at all. Um, I was surprised, but I have to accept uh, that the site searches for such a location have been fruitless. We're told there's there been over 30, uh, and uh, we have to accept that. Uh, so we are where we are. We have to uh, address this application on its merits. Uh, and undoubtedly, it uh, ideally should have been in a better, con better state with uh, prospective conditions set out. Uh, now, Chairman, I'm sorry I've not made this, this this recommendation or suggestion to you before. I should have thought about it earlier in the meeting or indeed earlier before today. But it occurs to me that we have a precedent uh, in local authority operations uh, where we deal with urgent matters. We delegate such as the, the question of these conditions, which obviously are... Uh, of great importance, not only because at the moment they are silent, we don't know much about them, uh, and members here, local members, my brother, local members, uh, at parish council, understandably, are concerned about the comprehensive nature of these conditions. 
And as I said, we, we do have a precedent in local government for dealing with this sort of situation. Uh, we delegate uh, the finalization of conditions to an officer in consultation with chairman of the committee or local member, whatever. So I just venture to suggest, uh, invite you and, uh, and Jim to think about that, whether you would be able to accept that as an amendment to uh, your recommendation effectively. If you're able to accept it as, a, as an amendment to your recommendation, then let's hear it. Uh, if you're not able to accept it as, recommend, as an amendment to your recommendation, well, again, let's hear that. And uh, you might find that someone here proposes it, in which case it'll be forced upon you. Uh, but I, I venture to suggest that uh, uh, that will, uh, it would certainly help me come to terms with uh, the application and in particular help me to understand uh, how the conditions are going to be addressed uh, ticked off and finally uh, imposed on, on, on the grant. Yes, thank you, Councillor Shepherd. I'll take advice from my right hand side if you. Having consulted with the experts on my right, Councillor Shepherd, they accept that that is a, a reasonable method of moving forward and acceptable and legal. So uh, do you go so far as then to amend your recommendation to committee in that fashion? If, if you wish to propose that, then the recommendation, then I'm sure... Well, it's not for me to propose, it's for the whoever is proposing the, the, the matter. I mean... <laughs> I'm inviting you to propose it as, a, as, as an amendment to your recommendation. If you prefer it to be done by the proposer of the motion, then fine. I think from a technical point, it's happy to come from me, if you like the committee to say that you'd like to make an amendment to the recommendation that it be as such, so as to be to include consultation with what you deem appropriate um, in terms of then it is a... And is it going to be the chairman? Well, it be, could be the chairman with Jim and ward member or not, or just the two of us, I don't know. What, whatever the committee deems um, proper. Councillor Manners. Um, then following on for that, then I would propose that we accept the recommendation with the condition that the chair of this meeting and the ward members are involved in the deliberations and agreement to the to the conditions. Unless there's a ch change to that. Okay, you happy with that? Yeah. Do we have a seconder for that amendment? So, Councillor Parker. Just one further question. If agreement can't be reached by that subgroup, what happens then? Well, well, technically, um, I would say that the recommendation can't be fulfilled, so we'd come back to committee. Um, so in effect, what you are doing is, um, and I would suggest uh, it's on the basis it, with the chair and the ward member, so that the recommendation would read, delegate to the assistant director for growth in consultation with the chairman of the planning committee and the relevant ward member uh, to grant planning permission subject to conditions, et cetera, and receive such technical information. And we could add on if such agreement between the consultees is not met, then the matter should be brought back before the committee. Because in effect, the planning permission wouldn't be issued. I mean, the only addition I'd make is ward members. Ward members. Right. We're we have multi ward members. That's right. <laughs> In fact, three of them. <laughs> Councillor Heron, sorry. And can I ask that those uh, the the detailing of the conditions deals with the issues of the fencing, and the access and the fencing around the um, the property that's badly affected, and that that woodland, that strip of woodland, 
and, and quite happy to delegate that to in the involvement of the ward member. I think that's not unreasonable. Yes, de delegation is always to an officer, not never to any ward member, but in consultation, in consultation with members, that's how it works. Right, having had a, uh, a proposal and a second for that motion, which is voted out by our legal expert, are we happy to go to a vote on that at this point? So all those in favour of the recommendation? Unanimous. Unanimous. Thank you for that. So we move on to item seven, which I invite the officers to change positions. Just a moment while the officer gets uh, the screen sharing going. Right, are you, are you ready, Dennis? Once he's lubricated himself, we'll be ready to go. Right, thank you. Case officer Dennis Winter Bottom will now present the item seven on the agenda. Thank you. Right, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an application for the erection of a bespoke high-tech distribution facility comprising around 64,000 square metres of ground floor space. That's the footprint of the building, including ancillary office space. Um, it will have three and a half mezzanine levels, which will then give a total area of around 200,000 square feet of floor space. Of mezzanine floor space with a total area of 265,000 square feet of storage and distribution floor space, which will be used within use class B8. You've got the aerial site plan on front, in front of you at the moment, which outlines the application site. More recent up-to-date aerial view, which shows the works that are in progress within the Northampton Gateway rail freight interchange site. Works, groundworks are already progressing on that site. 
um, and the members saw at the site visit recently that the works have now progressed to actually form the development plateau, which will actually be the basis on which this proposed building and development will be built if permission is granted. I mentioned the Northampton Gateway Railway Interchange. The application site is a development plateau within an already approved nationally significant infrastructure project, which is the Northampton Gateway Railway Interchange. The development site forms the southernmost development plateau, which hopefully you can see outlined with the red line at the bottom of the uh, plan that's now displayed. This slide is showing you the parameters plan, which was approved as part of the Northampton Gateway DCO, which outlines the various zones within the DCO, and the application site is zone A4, which uh, it gives you a little bit more detail of the infrastructure that's approved for the Northampton Gateway. You can see the rail freight terminal, which is the blue area adjacent to the West Coast Main Line Northampton Loop. Um, you can just about make out the proposed site access, which is the roundabout to the A405, and the rail corridors within the site, and the main spine access road, which runs between the zones uh, to the east of the site, and there is a, a branch off to the rail freight terminal. That infrastructure is being delivered now as part of the Northampton Gateway Development Consent Order Works. The building that is being proposed is a replacement, in effect, for a building that could be erected on Zone A4 under the permission granted by the Northampton DC, Gateway DCO. So there's an element of substitution in the floor space that will be approved through this planning commission. The DCO parameters plan permits a development of up to 281,000 square metres of floor space within zone A4. If the maximum floor area that was allocated to that zone under the DCO was taken up and the mezzanine's floor space, which is allocated across all the zones in the uh, development consent order was allocated as to the development. So the floor space that's being sought is less than the floor space of a building that could be developed under the Northampton Gateway. In assessing this proposal, though, we have assessed the impacts of the building that is being proposed. I just wanted to make that very clear. The significance of the Northampton Gateway development proposals and the parameters that constrain the building are is that the infrastructure that's being proposed as part of the Northampton Gateway development and which will be relied on to serve the building that's being proposed now, the impact of the building that's being proposed being within most of the parameters, all but one parameter of the DCO, means that the impacts that were assessed in the environmental statement with the DCO have been taken into account in the information that was available for that and that's been relied on to a large extent in this application. So for instance, the drainage infrastructure for this development will connect to the drainage infrastructure for the wider Northampton Gateway site, the sustainable drainage infrastructure that's already being developed and will have no greater impact. The transport assessment that's been produced for this building identifies the trip generation associated with the proposed building. And that's been identified to fall within the assessment that was made as part of the environmental statement for the DCO. So national highways have reviewed the transport assessment and the local highway authorities reviewed the transport assessment and they're satisfied that providing the mitigation which is required for the Northampton Gateway interchange site is delivered, it will have no greater impacts. The, mitig the highway mitigation that's required at this stage of the Northampton Gateway is the highway improvements at junction 15 and of course the highway improvements to provide the access to the A508. The Northampton Gateway DCO itself also requires additional highway mitigation in the form of the road village bypass and junction improvements to junction 15A. They are required 
as part of the delivery of the whole Northampton Gateway Railway Interchange site. So development on the other zones is consequent on all that highway mitigation being delivered. But for this particular development, it's the highway mitigation at Junction 15 and the A508 improvements that are required. And that is required. That's being secured through the Section 106 rather than through a condition to ensure that it's an obligation on the developer. The plan you've got in front of you shows the layout of the actual proposed development. The light gray oblong in the center is the warehouse building. It has sort of office pods at each corner. You'll see the car parking area is laid out to the east with an access that comes off the main estate spine road uh, close to the actual ac access roundabout for the A508. There are service yards proposed round the north, western and southern sides. The main HGV access is in the northwest corner. So there's a long access road from the estate roads up to the main gatehouse, which will be in the southwest corner, which of course allows for stacking of uh, HGV lorries entering the site. There's a second access to the site in the northeast corner that will provide a secondary HGV egress and also an access to the car park and also for bus services that will access the site. Uh, at the bottom, at the southern end of the car parking, there's a dedicated bus turning, bus stands and turning area. The green area to the south is proposed to be a landscaped area. The development plot actually extends up to the red line boundary, which is to the south of the green area. The requirement of this bespoke occupier is actually for a smaller footprint than could be developed, delivered on the development plot, but they want a taller building. So there's a trade-off in terms of footprint and height. So the developer is proposing to use the additional ground floor area to enhance the landscaping proposals that are already being implemented on the periphery of the Northampton Gateway development site itself. So that will take the form of earth mounding with additional tree planting and shrub planting to provide additional uh, screening mitigation for this particular development, which will complement the existing structural landscaping proposals for the wider site. Uh, in terms of a few parameters into, uh, of the actual building itself, the building length will be about 300 meters, the building width is 180 meters. The actual building height is 25 meters, slightly over, to the main part of the roof. There will be two stair towers, one on the northern elevation, one on the southern elevation, which will extend by a further three meters, up to 28 meters, to allow access onto the roof, particularly for fire, so, uh, fire purposes, firefighting purposes. The building finished floor level is 89.5 meters above ordnance datum. So that means the very top of the building will be 117 meters. The majority of the roof will be at 114 meters. The building that could be constructed under the Northampton Gateway Development Consent Order couldn't exceed 109 meters above ordnance datum. So effectively, the most of this building will be five meters above the parameter with two small areas that will extend up to about seven and a half meters beyond the 109 meter parameter height. The next slide shows you, you the proposed building elevations. It's uh, the palette chosen for the cladding is a gray palette, which is considered to be appropriate for this location. Hopefully you'll see when I come to run through the landscape and visual assessment, most of the views of this building will be seen against either the ground or the planting. You don't get many views where you're looking against the building with a backdrop of the sky. So the gray colors tend to be more recessive in that context. There is one issue outstanding, which we have, which we have can be resolved through the um, application through a condition. And I, again, I hope it will, you may be able to see it in the landscape and visual uh, assessment. 
the proposal at the moment is to use lighter colors for the very uppermost levels. And it's considered that those are not the most appropriate. By using a darker shade cladding, it will improve the recessive character and therefore make it, render it less visible in some, particularly those more distant views and help the building recess into the existing landscape more readily. So one of the conditions proposes that the detail of the cladding is reserved for subsequent approval. That's simply an asymmetric view of the building showing you the two corners. The detail here is a little bit more detail of the proposed landscaping. You can just about make out the contours to the earth mounding proposed at the southern end of the building. Again, the advice we received from our landscape, uh, external landscape advisors was that the planting scheme perhaps doesn't do as much as it could to help to mitigate the visual impact of the building um, through an enhanced sort of planting regime, planting schedule, and through the use of more appropriate species, the effect of the planting could be enhanced. So again, it's proposed to reserve the approval of the landscaping proposals sub for subsequent approval through a condition. The next slides I'm going to take you through the sort of landscape and visual assessment that was submitted with the application, because clearly the significant impact of this building is the additional height, the extra height over and above the building that could be implemented under the DCO. A landscape and visual assessment has been submitted. It's been reviewed by our external advisors. And the general conclusion is that the building with the additional height, it would not have any significant adverse visual effect over and above the effect of a building that could be delivered under the DCO parameters. What I propose to do, the following slides take you through viewpoint uh, views and photo montages that were prepared as part of the LVA from the viewpoints that you can see in this slide. The slides start to the west with viewpoint E and then progressively around to the south and ending at viewpoint H, which is over way over to the east up near Preston Deanery and Wooden. You can see uh, the first slide is um, an existing view taken before the development started. Uh, it's taken from the eastern, uh, sort of eastern extremity of Blisworth. Uh, it's one of the footpaths that takes you down from to Blisworth to the West Coast Main Line, and you can just see the footbridge over the West Coast Main Line in the center. The lower photograph is taken from a little further east along Corton Hall Road. Uh, so you're moving closer to the actual Northampton Gateway site. And you can see center is Highfields Wood, which is actually within the Northampton Gateway site. It's one of the areas of existing woodland that's being retained in the Northampton Gateway development. To the left is Church Fields uh, Wood, which is again another area of existing woodland which is being retained. And you can just see to the right of Highfields Wood, the existing commercial developments at Grange Park. The, the effect of retaining those two areas of woodland is to provide um, to maintain a reasonable visual screen in views from the west. In addition to that, there's also going to be substantial landscape funding provided along the western boundary to the Northampton Gateway. That's part of the structural landscaping proposals. The next two slides, and I hope you can see them, are actually a photo montage of that of the view taken at D. You might just be able to see in the distance there, the top slide shows you a photo montage of buildings that would, could be delivered under the DCO. So you slight gray areas to either side of Highfields Wood. So those are the buildings at a height of 109 meters above Ordnance Survey datum, so 20 meter high buildings. The bottom slide, um, I can try and make them a bit bigger, it might help. The bottom slide 
is a photo montage of the proposed building on plot seven. You can see it slightly more visible than the previous building, but not significantly so. But I think this slide also serves to highlight the point I made earlier under the cladding. You can see the gray cladding proposed to the office pod tower in the southeastern corner, which is much more recessive than the lighter cladding that you can see on the upper levels of the uh, actual warehouse building itself. So if you can ima imagine that a darker cladding there, you can see how it would recess more into the existing views. This slide is the same view, but at year 15, once the proposed landscaping proposals have had time to take mature. And you can see you can still see the building, but the effect is reduced. Uh, the next two slides are moving further along to viewpoint B along Courting Hall Road. And you can see the effect of some of the existing woodland that's outside the site, existing planting outside the site, has in, effectively in screening the site. The lower photograph is actually taken on the other side of the, that central tree belt that you can see on the top photograph. There's a second area of woodland just beyond it, which still provides screening to the site, but you can now see the development plateau emerging sort of between the solitary tree on the left and the clump of trees in the middle. The next two slides are the photo montage from that viewpoint, and you can see the building emerging. The building that you can actually see is the plot seven building proposed. The yellow dotted line, which I hope you can see, is an outline of a potential building that could be delivered under the DCO. So you can, it, it's to try and illustrate the difference in height between what could be delivered and what this current application is seeking. This is at year one, and the bottom photograph, which I'll move up, is at year 15, once, again, once the planting again has had time to mature. Again, it won't completely screen the building, but it does have an effect in reducing the, the visual impact. But I, I'd also stress this is not a public viewpoint. This is from within, this is a private viewpoint effectively. Moving on, we're mo moving on to viewpoints on the A508. Some of you will be aware of where the speed camera is on the A508. Um, you can see the existing uh, roadside planting there effectively screen view, screens views of the site. This view is from the A508, but further north, so closer to the actual uh, Northampton Gateway development. And I've included a, pic, uh, a view, a more recent view that shows some of the Northampton Gateway works in progression. What you can see here is the site compounds on the right-hand side, the planting that's associated with the Courting Hall Brook, which runs west-east across the southern part of the site, and the start of the earth mounding, which is, forms part of the structural landscaping for the wider gateway site uh, on the land to the south of the Courting Hall Brook. That will be planted again uh, with, with planting in various locations. So moving on, same location, what you've got now is a photo montage of, to the left, the plot seven building that's being proposed and straight ahead, buildings that could be delivered under the Northampton Gateway Scheme. And this is the same view again at year 15 when boundary planting proposed around the southern and edge of the, um, and around the sort of periphery is, is starting to mature. Again, it doesn't hide the buildings. You can't hide buildings at this height, but it does reduce the visual effects. Moving further east, we're now moving up on the Quinton Road. Uh, you can see the existing pl planting that's already there serves to effectively screen the site. You might just glimpse, uh, I think it's part of the site compound in the center. The next one is taken actually from Courting Hall Gardens, which is an historic gardens. And as you can see, the existing planting completely obscures the site. 
final view is from view H, which was, you recall, way over to the east. It's actually on the Newport Pagnell Road between Wooten and uh, Preston Deanery. The view you're looking at now, you're actually looking, you can see the existing developments at Grange Park in the center. New develop, new housing development of Wooten, obviously on the, on the right-hand side. And the final view is introducing the gateway buildings. You can see that they are more present in the view, but again, they sit below the landscape and they don't significantly alter what you can see in the previous one, a view of commercial buildings, but there are more of them. So, I just wanted to bring your attention to the written updates in the sense that the recommendation has been slightly amended uh, with respect to the section 106, which now includes the reference to the point I made earlier about ensuring that the mezzanine floor space, the overall limit set in the develop, uh, Northampton Gateway DCO is not exceeded and therefore limits the amount of mezzanine floor space that can be delivered on other development plots within the DCO site. And it, the written updates also included the proposed conditions. Yes, thank you for that, Dennis. I welcome the uh, reference to the pallet. I fortunately or unfortunately live near Panatoni Park at Junction 16, where there's some nice white buildings and a real dark background, and they look absolutely hideous. Um, so, I, as you say, we're looking into a dark area with this, so I would welcome the use of a darker pallet to try and disguise it and the enhanced uh, planting you're suggesting. Right, before we get to uh, speakers, are there any questions of the officers of the presentation you're just saying? Yes, Councillor Kilroy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just for my perspective, uh, when I'm driving around Northampton, uh, you obviously get the floodlights and the cricket ground sticking out really quite prominent. Uh, with this development here going higher, will you get the towers sticking out? So no matter where you are in Northampton, you'll say that that's where those towers are, that's where the floodlights are, that's where Express Lift Tower is. Is that what you're going to see? Sorry, when you say towers, do you mean the stairway the two bit, towers? Yeah, the two stairways going yeah. up. Those two the two stairway towers are very, have a very small footprint. Yep. Uh, it's probably best seen on the um, asymmetric view. You can see the two towers that actually extend above the main roof are the one to the north and the one to the south. Yeah. And you can see they don't extend by very much. I don't think they'll be particularly noticeable in terms of the additional height and the size, and particularly if the cladding you know, is toned down so that the eye is not drawn to them. No, that's great. Uh, I'll just uh, second the if that's all right, Chair. Uh, because the building's gone up so much higher, uh, the eight metres, Will the signage be positioned lower down? So when you do look at it, your colour palette is more trying to deflect from the size of it. What you don't want is big letters um, standing out. That, that's a good point, and it's something I meant to mention and omit it. The signage that's shown on this building is not going to be approved at this stage. It would be subject to advertisement consent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Heron. Since, since height is the issue, who checks what level the ground is? <laughs> and how do you do it? I'm not even sure because the, the ground is made up on this I think that might point. be a question you might want to put to the agent who's going to speak later. But I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the delivering and constructing the building, there are a number of factors that are interlinked. Inter interrelated and interlinked, one of which is particularly the drainage arrangement. So you start at the lowest level, where is your outfall, and you have to move up, and everything has to be precisely calibrated so that your drainage flows and falls, don't overload systems, don't lead to over. So I'm sure there are some very technical people out there doing some very careful measuring. That doesn't mean they might not get it Get it wrong, but I'm sure that there will have measures in place. But I say it may be something that the agent can respond to. Thank you. Further questions from 
Councillor Parker, please. Yeah, just going back to the lighting. Um, are they going to be on towers or are they going to be hanging off the warehouse? They're, they're, I didn't include details. There is a lighting scheme proposed. They are on columns. The details are, are being, uh, the design follows best practice guidance in terms of the Institute of British uh, Lighting uh, Association. The luminaires are all designed to minimize and constrain the light spread to the area that's meant to be illuminated. So from what I've seen of it, I have confidence that it will do that and there will not be escape, but it, they will be obviously mounted uh, the lighting to the external areas will be mounted on columns and there will be some lamps attached to buildings, to the building itself above loading bay doors. Right, but on the columns, they won't exceed the height of the building, will they? Oh, no. No, thank you. Yes, Councillor James. Near Thank you. Um, why was it necessary to limit the mezzanine floor spaces that may be provided on land in zones A1 to A3? 76,747 square metres. Potentially a lot of rateable value there. The, whenever a development's put in place, yeah. in terms of assessing its appropriateness and suitability, you have to look at all the impacts. And one of the impact of a commercial development is how much floor space, what are the impact consequences of that? And one of the consequences is trip generation. How many people are likely to be attracted to work there, yeah. to visit the site? And there are sort of models that use an appropriate assessment for to translate the amount of floor space into a number of vehicle trips. And it depends on the use the building's put to and a number of other factors, location can be one. Yeah. So in the context of the Northampton Gateway rail freight interchange, the environmental statement assessed the floor space that was allowed, which is 468,000 square meters of floor space, plus an additional allowance of 155,000 square meters of mezzanine floor space that can be incorporated into buildings on those development plots. This being a standalone planning commission, of course, potentially could sit alongside the Northampton Gateway floor space. Right. There's a certain, uh, effectively, there's a certain element of replacement because it's actually going to be on one of those plots that would have been used to deliver some of the approved floor space. But the mezzanine floor space could still have been allocated to the other development plots in its entirety. In reviewing the transport assessment, national highways raised the concern that that might, the highway mitigation might then not be satisfactory. That might require further highway mitigation. So to avoid that situation, they recommended that the mezzanine floor space be capped to the total approved um, in the impact that were assessed in the ES for the Northampton Gateway. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of the officer before? Yes. Councillor Manners. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dennis, we spoke about it on the site visit. They're not proposing to put PV panels on the roof here, is my understanding. Is that right? Well, I've had subsequent conversations with the agent, and it may be the agent can provide you with more information. My understanding now is that the building is being designed to a sufficient loading that would enable the installation of PV. And I, again, it may be more appropriate to ask the agent, but my understanding is that it does form part of their energy strategy going forward. Great. Well, that's very encouraging to hear. And Chair, I mean, it just really raises the issue yet again. That we do need to have a policy as part of this council. And the sooner we have that policy that we can implement and actually enforce um, the climate change objectives, the better. And uh, I, we, we've been talking now about three months about this, and I they haven't seen any action as such. So I do urge some urgency on this, please. I fully, fully concur what you're saying, Councillor. Thank you. And yeah, save your question for the agent. If there's no further question, I'll invite the agent to come forward. Mr. Steve Harley of Oxalis Planning. Usual three minutes when you're ready.
turning the microphone on here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, your officer's report sets out a clear recommendation for approval following their assessment of the proposals. This follows consideration of the context provided by the approved and now under construction Northampton Gateway Rail Freight Interchange site, as you've just heard and seen, hopefully, as well as comments from consultees. I just wanted to make a few key points before you discuss the application. The proposal is for the first building on the, on the Seagrove Logistics Park at M1 Junction 15, and as you've heard, is a bespoke building to meet the requirements of a specific occupier. The context, for, for context, this same occupier uses rail at some other site. Members will have observed the extent of the works already underway on site during your visit, including to construct the rail terminal, as well as off-site works to deliver the significant improvements to Junction 15 of the M1. As you've heard, the proposed building is taller than that envisaged and approved through the development consent order, the DCO, but is otherwise in accordance with the uses and type of building already approved in outline on this site and fits within the context of the agreed traffic and trips assessed and approved for the site as a whole. I think Dennis gave a helpful explanation of that. Therefore, the only material issue is any change in likely effects as a result of the change in height that, that you've heard about compared to the likely effects of the consented scheme. This has been assessed through a landscape and visual assessment, impact assessment and LVIA, prepared and submitted by the applicant. And that assessment has been subject to independent specialist review by the council. The conclusions of the council's assessment is that the additional height, as you've just heard from Dennis, would not result in any new significant effects. There are no objections from any technical consultees and the officer's recommendation is therefore that the building is acceptable. Just to say a few words on some of the detail and issues that I know are of, of some interest. Um, the, the building proposed would deliver a high level of, of energy efficiency and be built to high standards, a minimum of BRIAM very good in accordance with your policies and in accordance with the DCO. The building would deliver 89 EV charging spaces, for example, as, as part of the, um, the design. The energy strategy... 60 seconds remaining. Thank you. The energy strategy for the site will use uh, solar thermal and air source heat pumps and the extent and details of, of a future solar PV array remains under discussion between the applicant and occupier with ongoing technical work with third parties regarding the ability to feed power back into the grid. However, as you've heard, the building construction design has been future proofed, so the roof structure is able to take the additional loads of PV panels across basically the whole roof, as I understand it, if, if required. Therefore, while not part of the detail before you now, the full expectation of both the building owner and the building occupier is that there will be extensive use of PV to generate renewable energy on site in due course. As you saw on site, Seagro are actively delivering the infrastructure and will continue to do so. And the occupier is very keen to invest in this new site and in the economy of West Northamptonshire. So if approved, plan to begin to operate the building at next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harley. That's very welcome comments. Uh... Councillor Heron, do you want to go first with your question? <laughs> yes. Um, what's ground level? <laughs> Perfectly sensible question. And, and, and unlike Dennis, I'm not necessarily the right person for the technical version. I'll give you the, I'll give you the simple version, if I may. Um, this site is a consented site, as, you, as you're aware, and, and is, is therefore, we know a lot about the approval we've got, defines levels, parameters across the site, including ground levels. And I think you mentioned specifically the roads and how do you know where they'll sit in terms of, of levels. So the, the, the on-site infrastructure, as you've seen, is largely being delivered already. We've already submitted, as we're required to do under the DCO, certain details for approval by others, including the Highways Authority. So we have to work within the parameters of the approval we've got, and we have to submit detailed plans and, and cross-sections, designs of the roads and the plateaus to confirm that they are where they need to be in terms of what the, what the approval says we can do. So the, 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 the levels, I think Dennis was referring to AOD levels in terms of, um, you know, that's the above ordinance datum. Um, it's, it can be precisely measured. I mean, you were asking who checks and how would they do it? As I understand it, you, essentially GPS can, can, be, can be very accurately used to, to monitor whether things are where they need to be. And the design is, is, is based on you know, the, the geographical information systems and it's tied to specific geographic information so it is quite accurately designed and then approved as I say by development consultees so if we were trying to for example put things higher or lower than they should be that would be that would be very obvious to the technical consultees through the technical design process that we have to go through long and rambling I hope, I hope but hopefully it answers the question it's, we we had had uh, issues with much more domestic buildings where things have ended up um, uh, where height has been an issue um, because we haven't established 
what ground level is yeah it's ended up um remarkably taller and people and and because this it's a much bigger building but because height is 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 the issue um that you're asking for permission on i just thought i'd ask who's who's established the base i understand well i hope i've answered the question yeah. thank, thank, thank you Councillor. You. i mean my basic understanding is the site has a one point which is a reference point for the whole site that says this is datum zero or whatever and everything is then measured against that one point on the site so there is a reference point that they're working to and like he says with gps councillor manners do you want to come up with any more on the ev side anybody else got a question for the agent yeah the councillor parker yeah just uh, picking up on the uh dv which is great because of that roof uh, area obviously you've got rainwater which I think you'd classify as grey water now. Could you use that? Or would you think about using that rather than just discharging it straight to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, under, under Brianne, there are a range of um, solutions and, and, and uh, technologies that can be explored to, to score the, the right points, if that's the right way to describe it, under the Brianne regime. And I understand grey water recycling is, is one of those. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure to what extent that features as part of the current plans for the building, but the both the you know, Seagrow and, and the occupier are quite forward-looking organisations, so I dare say it's something they're looking at. But the, the honest answer, Council, is I don't know whether grey water recycling features as part of the, the detail on the uh, under their Briam approach. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Harley. Thank you, Chair. Dennis, you want to come back on anything that's been raised during this time? Okay, we'll move into the debate stage. Councillor Parker. I propose we accept officer's advice. Do we have a second for that proposal? <laughs> you can't second your proposal. <laughs> okay, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour, we accept the Thank you kindly. That's unanimous. So at 6.12, I thank you all for your attendance, albeit along, and your uh, thorough deliberations. I think you exercised very well this afternoon. I thank you for that. And uh, I did make, declare the meeting closed.